All right, I think we're live now. Sorry for the delay. Um, this is CS50 on Twitch. My name is Colton Ogden, and today we're going to continue the stream that we did last week on Friday, um, where we started implementing the game Snake from scratch. Recall, we ended up putting something uh, together that looked a little bit like this. So we had a uh, little, oh, sorry, forgot to switch the actual machine over there. There we go. We had something that looked a little bit like this, so almost like a little Etch-a-Sketch going, but not exactly uh, Snake in the sense that most people, I think, recognize Snake. Um, but a lot of the pieces are still there. You know, we went from having a cube that moved across the screen to having a uh, cube that sort of moved discreetly across the screen in, almost, in like a grid sort of way. Um, talking about how we can actually divide our game space up into a grid, which allows us to then start transitioning into games like roguelikes and other games that are more tile-based, which we could definitely get into uh, in the future. Um, and then we started talking about a snake data structure, and we talked about some basic drawing routines in Love 2D, and all sorts of other stuff. Um, won't go too much into the details because the VOD will be up, and this and the other video will also be going on YouTube. Um, but today, a couple of the problems that we want to solve are one, make sure that when we do eat an apple in our game, um, rather than our snake kind of just drawing an infinite line, we want to actually get rid of the, the tail, we want to pop the tail, while continuing to draw you know, the head as it's moving in another direction. And another big thing that we want to bite off today is making sure that when we collide with other parts of the snake, that we trigger a game over, as uh, I would have just done right there. Um, and those are two sort of big pieces that we're going to bite off, and they're actually not terribly difficult. I spent a little bit of time over the weekend actually thinking through the problem, and I was a little bit tired last time, but we should be good today. Uh, and then if we do have time, which I think we will, we're going to be on for a three-hour stream today, we'll take a look at um, having like an intro screen, like a, you know the word snake, press enter to start, because right now you kind of just get right into the action, which is a little bit tricky um, to like jump just right into. And then also a game over screen, so that when we do intersect with the snake, the game should stop, maybe transition us to another screen with some text on it that says you got a game over, um, and then display your score. Suleith says, hello, hello Suleith, good to see you. Um, Bavik Knight says, hey, how's it going? Bavik Knight, good to see you again. Um, and Suleith asks, will this be re-uploaded? Uh, yes, so last week's video and this video will be up, uh, uploaded to YouTube. They should be uploaded um, today, tonight, if not tomorrow morning. Um, and the, the VOD from last week is actually, should be accessible on this uh, Twitch account. The GitHub for the actual code itself is on this URL, so github.com slash coltonoscopy slash snake50, um, and you'll be able to see the main.lua file that's in there just by itself. And recall, main.lua is the entry point for Love2D, which is the framework that we used last Friday. Uh, if unfamiliar, if you're just joining the stream for the first time, Love2D is the framework that we're using to do all of the game programming, um, all the graphics, all the windowing, all the input, all that stuff. So if you can go to love2d.org, by default, it should take you to a page that looks like this, and then you can download the version appropriate for your operating system. So I'm on a Mac, I'm on Mojave, um, so you can just download here. If you want to download other versions and uh, older versions, you have an option to do so here. Bavik Knight says, glad to be here. Glad to have you with us, Bavik Knight. Thanks for joining. All right, so let's dive right in. Um, briefly, I'll just summarize the code that we have. So we have a constant table up here, so just a set of constants that just basically say, oh, what's the window width and height? What's the tile size? Tile size being our sort of our grid size, so we could, we could think of it that way as well. The number of tiles on the X and Y, and then a few constants to represent uh, particular slots in the grid, whether a tile is empty, whether it's a snake head, whether it's a snake body, whether it's an apple. Those are the main sort of gameplay mechanics at play. And then lastly, a, a constant for the time in seconds that should elapse um, before the snake actually moves an individual grid tile in the game. Uh, we have a few other variables here, so a font, a score, which is important, the actual grid for our tiles. Um, this is the data structure that actually holds the zeros, ones, twos, and threes that represent what's going on in our game world. Um, the snake X and the snake Y, which is where the snake's head is located, um, whether our snake, what direction our snake is moving in, which sh this should probably be called local uh, snake direction equals right, um, but we've already called it snake moving, so we'll just keep it that way. Uh, and then a snake timer, because remember, we do have to keep track of how much time has actually elapsed um, over the course of all the frames before we end up moving our snake. Um, so we basically check snake timer against snake speed. If snake timer is greater than snake speed, then we should move to the next location. 
Um, and then here, we do need a data structure to represent our snake. So uh, because we need to make sure that we pop our tail off of the snake whenever we move, we need to keep track of all the nodes that we add to the snake uh, as time goes on. Um, Sule says, where did you learn all of this? Is there a Love2D manual? Um, so yeah, actually, Love2D has some excellent documentation. Um, so there's a very basic set of tutorials just on the main page. So here you can see there's some examples, a basic application, you draw text, draw an image, play a sound. There are some full games you can take a look at. Um, I believe some of these have source code and some of these are actually commercial Steam projects, which is cool, which goes to show you that you can actually use this to make a published game on Steam if uh, that's something that's of interest to you. Um, the actual documentation is here. So at the very bottom right, you can just click on any of those modules and that will take you to the um, page for that. CPU intensive says tall hair. Yeah, I know, I need a haircut super badly, like suit, like really bad. Um, but you can go and look at the, uh, if you go to uh, love2d.org slash wiki slash love is where you can actually see the documentation. And there's a bunch of different namespaces here. Love, love.audio, love.data, love.event. Um, we're going to be using pretty much just love.graphics. Um, we use love.window as well, and then the core functions that you can access in love. So love.load, love.update, love.draw, these are the functions that make up our game loop. Um, if you're familiar, we talked about this sort of last week. Every frame, uh, which is usually 1 60th of a second, love2d will execute some code in a function called love.update and love.draw each frame, update happening before draw, and at the very start of your program, it'll call a function called love.load. Love.load sort of sets up everything. Um, if you have some variables that need to be initialized or some resources that need to be loaded, optionally, as we did up here, you could just put them at the very top of your script and they'll all execute in advance in much the same way. Um, but as is sort of tradition, you'll see uh, a lot of these functions like love.window.setTitle, love.graphics.setFont, love.window.setMode, a lot of these functions that sort of set up the game, set up the the um, state machine that is Love2D, uh, in a sense, um, those all exist here as it does setting the random number generator, which we did last week, and maybe initializing some data um, and such. JP guy says, hello again. Hello, JP, good to see you. I wanted to have the Twitch chat enabled in today's stream, but we we're having a little bit of difficulties with Streamlabs. Um, so we're gonna try again. Next week, we should actually have the embedded chat in the final video so that folks watching online on YouTube or whatnot after the fact can sort of see what people in the chat are saying. So looking forward to trying that, hopefully tomorrow. Um, so tomorrow we're having another stream with Kareem Zidane, if anybody's familiar, he's gonna be doing a Git and GitHub stream. Uh, Elias says, hello again from Morocco. Hello Elias, good to see you again. Thanks for coming in. Um, just to cover a little bit more of what we have going on in our love.keypressed function, it takes a key. Remember that we were testing for input, so if we pressed left, right, up, or down, we should set our moving variable to left, right, up, or down accordingly. And then we do a check in our update function. So remember, update executes once every 60th of a second, approximately, every, uh, every frame. And uh, if basically we're moving in any of these given directions, then we should increment or decrement our snake X and snake Y variables, which remember that's where our head is gonna be and that's sort of where its index is in the grid. Originally that was our pixel value, so we were measuring our square in pixels, but remember that was kind of continuous movement, it wasn't actually adhering to a grid, so a little bit trickier to do collision detection that way. Um, so we divided it up into a grid and we make sure to move our uh, snake uh, in increments of 32 pixels instead of just one pixel. JP says, how long have you been streaming? I just got home from work. Uh, just for a couple minutes. So we're just reviewing all of the code that we did last Friday. JP, I know you were there, so this is all um, old hat to you, but in case anybody's watching who needs a uh, refresher, this sort of uh, uh, is a recap of everything that we did. And then in draw grid, we're basically just checking each uh, tile in a, in a nested loop in our uh, tile grid table at y, x for one to max tiles y and one to max tiles x on the y and the x axes. Um, if it's empty, don't draw anything. If it's apple, draw red. If it's uh, head, draw a uh, lighter shade of green, so kind of a cyan green, since we have, remember, love.graphics.set color takes in four variables, red, green, blue, and alpha for a, a cyan-ish value. It needs to be one and 0 0.5. One and one here, G and B both being one, would be completely cyan. Um, but that's a little bit too bright, so we're just going to make it 0.5 on the uh, on the blue component. Uh, 
And then the body itself, we're just making kind of a dark green. So instead of setting G all the way to 1, we're setting it to 0.5, which just kind of is halfway between black and full green, effectively. And then we draw at our x, y. We subtract 1 from the x and the y, multiply that value by 32, because tables are 1 indexed by default, but coordinate systems are 0 indexed. So we need to decrement our x, y, and then multiply that end value by tile size. That will have the effect of drawing that, um, that uh, rectangle, that square, at the appropriate pixel coordinate in our, uh, in our game. Um, the draw snake function we ended up actually not using, so I'm actually going to, I think I'm just going to delete that. I don't think we actually need to draw that. To draw, the grid itself is going to handle drawing the snake, so I'm just going to take away the draw snake call. I'm going to take away the, the bit of code down near the draw snake function. I'm going to save it. Uh, initializing the grid is fine. And then up in our update function was sort of where we had the last bit of uh, problem solving before we ended the stream at the three hour mark, and that was figuring out, checking for an apple, right, and then adding a head, mo uh, a head node to the data structure and trying to pop the tail off if we, um, uh, if we do get a, if we, if we don't get a, a, an apple rather, we should pop the tail off of the data structure and delete that, or rather set to empty that node in the 2D array, in the 2D table. If we uh, don't get an apple on the next uh, on the next grid index where our snake head is moving, what we should do is um, still push in uh, basically the algorithm that it's going to be is we still want to push an element onto the, onto the snake, uh, onto the front of the snake, so basically add a head element, right? Um, but then we're going to pop off the tail so that it's going to just have an effect of shifting the snake one tile in whatever direction we're moving. And this will work even if our snake is only one tile large um, because that snake, uh, as soon as we do that, it will have two elements, so it will have a head and it will have a tail with which we can pop, that tail being the head as it just was in the last frame at uh, just size one. Um, and so all of this code is a little bit convoluted and doesn't quite get the job done in a, in a fantastic way. So what I'm going to do is actually from line 95 down to line 119 um, after we've deleted the other things, basically checking for the apple all the way to the bottom of this, um, checking whether the, the size of the snake tiles table is greater than one. I'm just going to delete all of that and we're going to sort of think about how we want to uh, solve this problem of getting our snake to move um, and also sort of keep its uh, body size if it eats more apples, right? So if I run this after deleting all that, it should still operate. Oh no, it's not. Okay, so it's not actually it's not actually moving currently. Um, let me just verify which part of that was the update location, right? Okay, because we're not actually updating the head location. So a couple things that we want to do. So the first thing we want to do when we're uh, moving in our snake world, right, is we want to pop a new head location after we've basically decided, okay, what direction are we moving in? And assuming that we've uh, increased, remember, snake timer sort of keeps, tracks of, uh, keeps track of delta time every frame, and if it exceeds 0.1, which is um, one-tenth of a second, uh, at that point, it'll have exceeded snake speed. We can then add a new head element onto the snake. So what I'm going to do is basically say, uh, pu uh, push a new head element onto the snake data structure, right? And so what this basically means is I'm going to do, uh, do a table.insert because this is how we push new elements into a table in, in Lua. Um, so our snake data structure, remember, that's this thing up here, the, uh, the uh, snake tiles right here, which by default just has one element, our snake x, snake y, right? So what I want to do if our, I'm getting a little bit lost here, and okay. So in our update function, or approximately line 96, if you're following along, um, into snake tiles at index one, so table.insert can take an optional second parameter, which is where in the table we want to insert that element. In this case, I want to insert it at the very front. So I want to insert it at index one, because remember, tables in Lua are one index. So one is the very first index. Zero normally is the first index in a programming language, um, but one in Lua is the, is the, first, uh, the first index. So we're going to use number one. Let's sit up just a little bit here. Uh, OK. So at that index, so at um, index one at the very front of our snake, we're going to want to insert the element that is going to be its head next, right? So 
it's quite simply snake x and snake y, which is what we've just altered up here in this if statement, the series of if statements. Um, if we're moving left, right, up, down, increment or decrement snake x or snake y, right? So we're going to do that. So now our data structure has the next head element set in place, and whatever the head was on the last frame is now one index below that, if that makes sense. So good, that's, that's easy, that's straightforward. Um, that doesn't actually influence the view of our application. So folks familiar with MVC um, might think of the snake tiles data structure as the, uh, as the M, the model of our application, whereas the grid is the view, the V of our application. So we've updated the model, and now we need to reflect this change in the view as well, effectively. We can think of it in that, in that sort of term. Um, so um, before we do that, though, the, the tile grid itself also keeps track of where the apple is. And the, the tile grid is kind of like a, a view and a model in a sense as well. So we're not completely cleanly um, sort of splitting up our, um, our application's infrastructure in as clean of a way as MVC, but you can sort of conceptualize it in a similar way. Um, but we can't, basically what we need to do is we need to pop, push this element, but then we also need to check to see whether or not the next element is an apple. And if it is, then we need to sort of change our behavior, right? We can't override that value with snake head just yet because then we won't know whether it was actually an apple that we consumed or whether we moved into another slot. Or for that matter, as we'll see later on, whether we've collided with our own body, which is going to be an important consideration when we do collision detection. So uh, let's do that. So the next step is going to be basically check to see, okay, are we uh, eating an apple? So if tile grid um, snake y snake x is equal to tile apple, and I don't actually need parentheses here, something that's a hard habit to break coming from uh, more C-like programming languages sometimes, uh, I still write parentheses in my conditions, but Python and Lua do not require that um, in, your, in your conditions. It'll still work, but it's not necessary. Um, so if it is an apple, then what we need to do, so if we are eating an apple, then what we need to do, because remember we looked at this last week, if we're eating an apple, then we need to basically um, uh, push an element onto, we need to keep the element pushed onto the stack basically um, and update the view and also re, uh, and update our score and then change the, um, uh, change the board to have a new apple somewhere else and then we also need to not pop our tail element um, off of the snake because the snake should increase in size um, therefore we need to keep the tail and then also add a head element which will have that effect which we looked at last, uh, last week when we saw the video. So um, if we ate an apple, remember last week when we did this, we, we talked about random number generation and getting a new random x and a y value, so which we're going to spawn a new apple. So let's do that. So um, I'm going to say local apple x, apple y, gets math.random, max tiles x, and math.random, max tiles y. Which hopefully you can see that. It might be a little bit small, actually. Let's increase that size just a little bit. I'm going to take this off. Um, if the chat can confirm that the, the text size looks okay on this, would appreciate it. Um, so we've created the, new, the two new variables that we're going to need for our, um, for our new apple. So what I'm going to do is tile grid, uh, oh, first things first, score gets score plus one, right? And then tile grid at apple y apple x is equal to tile apple, right? So now we're going to increase our score. Awesome, cool. Thanks, JP. Thanks, Nuwanda. Uh, we're going to increase our score. We're going to then generate two random variables, our x and y, which we're going to place a new apple into the grid. And then we're going to um, set that grid element at yx to the tile apple value. Now, uh, if it's not the case that we ate a apple, then we need to pop the tail, which will give us the effect of moving forward. And so this tail popping is sort of conditional on the fact 
um, that we ate an apple to begin with. So I'm going to go ahead and say uh, local tail gets uh, snake tiles at index number of snake tiles, which will have the effect of uh, indexing into our snake tiles table at the basically element of whatever the size is, which will give us the last element um, in our table. Um, and then this tail element should be deleted from the grid, right? So that this is where we erase our tail from the grid itself. So our model, remember, is the snake tiles, and then our view is the tile grid. Uh, so each time you move, you're checking whether or not you've eaten an apple, right? Correct. Yeah, we check first because that's going to determine whether we pop our tail element. And we don't want to override that tile grid element with our head element, um, our head, uh, head value rather, um, because then we won't know whether we've reached a, um, whether we've uh, eaten an apple because it's, uh, it just erases that information from the grid uh, permanently. It overwrites it. Um, so we're going to get, it, get our tail element from our snake tiles data structure. So this will be our tail, our last element in our, in our um, snake table. Um, as soon as we get the tail, what we want to do is update our view, right? So tile grid at tail2, tail1, right? Because remember, our elements are xy pairs. So as just as seen, in, sorry, rather, uh, yeah, in here. So in our snake tiles data structure, so snake x, snake y in this particular case, but it'll always be an xy pair. So every element in here at index 1 will be our x value. Every element in index 2 will be our y value. There are cleaner ways to do this. We could have uh, written it something like this. So x equals snake y, and then y equals snake x. And then we could have done something like snake tiles dot x, snake tiles dot y, which would be cleaner and a little bit more robust. But just as a first game example, we're going to kind of take things a little bit more literally. And we're going to just use numerical indices, which is the default love 2D and Lua behavior, rather. So once we've, uh, so basically now you can see that um, this element at index 2 is going to be our Y, and index 1 is going to be our X. We can set that to tile empty, right? And then the last thing we need to do is we need to actually pop that element off of our uh, snake data structure. We need to delete it from the snake. And so what we can do is do table.remove snake tiles. And so what that does, by default, table.remove can take an index, but you can also just give it the table. And what the result of that is going to be is just the last element in snake tiles, which is perfect for this use case, because we just want to take the last element from snake tiles and remove it from the data structure. So that's a big chunk uh, consumed here. The uh, head element is going to get pushed onto the data structure. Um, then we're going to choose whether we eat an apple. If we did eat an apple, we're going to increase our score, generate a new apple. If we didn't, we're going to pop our tail off and erase the tail. Um, so the next thing that we need to do, we re remember we added a, a, a head element, but we haven't actually adjusted our view because we needed to check for the apple in our view, right? So then one thing we need to do here is say tile grid at snake y, snake x should be equal to tile snake head. Uh, update the view with the next snake head location. And then we can write some comments here, whoops, which just says um, otherwise, uh, oh, uh, if we're eating an apple, increase score and generate new apple. Otherwise, what we want to do is uh, pop the tail and erase um, from the grid. And then update the view with the next snake head location. If everything has gone according to plan, this should work as soon as I hit Command L here. So I'm going to go ahead, eat this, and then voila. Now we have a snake that's moving. And last week, remember, we had only, um, we had, uh, only two elements max because our algorithm was, wasn't quite perfect last week. Um, but now, and we were sort of special casing it a little bit more than we needed to, but now it seems to work just fine. We have a, a snake, we're, our score is increasing every time we eat an apple, and also importantly, our, t uh, our snake body is growing in size and our tail is popping off um, as needed when we move around so that uh, it looks like we have this continuous um, sort of creature in our game space. So. It's, uh, you know, it's looking pretty good. There's a couple issues. So one you might have just noticed, I can actually move backwards and we get some graphical bugs, um, which isn't exactly what uh, behavior that we want. And then um, 
Another important thing is that we, if we collide with ourselves, it doesn't actually trigger a game over. And those two issues are sort of um, compounded with one another. And we're not actually drawing the um, body with, uh, or as a different color, which is sort of one of the things you wanted to do. Um, that bit is actually fairly easy, if I'm not mistaken. So um, by the way, in the chat, Bab Ignite says, yes, thanks, Bab Ignite. Appreciate the support. And JP, damn, that looks good. Thank you. I agree. I'm pretty happy. Last stream, it was pretty rough. Had a little bit of a brain fart. But the algorithm is fairly straightforward. It's fairly simple. Um, once you break it down and make it a little bit cleaner, it all sort of makes sense. Um, let's bite off another part. So we have the snake sort of drawing as one color, but we'd like the snake head to kind of be a different color from the body. So this should be as simple as tile grid uh, prior head y prior head x. Oh, this is actually a, this needs to be in a condition because this could uh, it could be the case that we have only one. Um, uh, oh wait, no, is that the case though? Because this is always going to run. After we've oh wait, no no because it is out of uh, uh, outside of the condition of eating an apple we do need this to be um, special cased so if it's the case that um, our snake is greater than one size so if number of snake tiles greater than one basically if our snake is greater than one tile long. Uh, we need to set the prior head value to a body value. And uh, tile snake body. And so what this will do is, assuming that our snake is at least uh, two units long, when we move forward, um, our, our, remember that we're always writing a snake head value to the next tile. But we want to write a snake body tile to whatever the head was on the last frame so that it looks like our snake has a body. It's sort of disjointed from the rest of it. Uh, Aeroman123 says, hello. It is really nice that you started this on Twitch. Thanks. Yeah, I'm super looking forward to seeing where it goes. Um, I like the fact that we can sort of have a conversation and talk back and forth. And maybe people can suggest um, you know, techniques or ideas. Uh, somebody suggested it, uh, an idea who was on stream last time for a new game that we'll be implementing on Friday called Concentration, which is like a, a tile matching, a card matching game. So I'm kind of looking forward to seeing where uh, where that goes. Um, but it's OK, so assuming that I, uh, I did this appropriately, if our snake is greater than one tile long and I run, so currently it's just one tile long, if I eat this apple, now our snake actually has a body segment that's a different, a different color. And it will increase in size, but our head will always be the color of the head element. So now we can better keep track sort of what direction we're going. And not that it's terribly difficult to see normally, um, but just a slight little change that has a um, sort of an accessibility feature, if you will. OK. Pretty, uh, pretty basic after all, despite uh, sort of last week kind of fizzing out a little bit at the end. Um, but now we have a few new features to think about. Excuse me. So first feature that we should probably think about is triggering the actual game over, right? Because right now, we can collect apples forever, but we're never going to lose the game. So the game isn't really, I guess it kind of is a game, but it's not really a full game because we're missing that uh, piece of the puzzle that actually lets us uh, you know, lose. Kind of important, because that's how you can sort of measure your skill. I've got to stay hydrated a little bit. Um, so yeah, next piece of the puzzle, how can I detect whether the snake, or rather, most more importantly, the snake head, is um, going to be eating a, uh, a piece of itself, basically. Uh, Bella Curis says, hi, Colton. Happy to be here today. Thanks for joining, Bella. Appreciate that you're here. Uh, we just ended up fixing up our snake game so that now we can run it. And uh, unlike last week, where we ended on it basically being a glorified Etch-a-Sketch uh, with the snake not deleting itself, now our snake can grow and move around uh, as a, an actual entity in our game world. So very satisfying. We've come a long way. And so let's decide how we're going to do this. So I'm thinking we can probably do something up here in uh, you know, where we sort of check for an apple. 
And probably just maybe before we check if it's an apple, we can probably just do something as simple as um, if tile grid snake y at snake x is equal to tile snake body, because it should never be able to move into another tile snake head. Um, then I want to do some sort of game over logic. Maybe I want to set some game over um, value to true, right? And then if the game over value is true, then I should probably change how I'm rendering the game. Probably down in my draw function, instead of drawing the grid, right? I can probably say, like, uh, if not game over, then draw the grid. Else, draw game over, maybe? End. And then um, these two, the score and the uh, other print statement, should probably go in here with this. Right? So print score and then draw. So draw game over basically is going to be the function that has this sort of different view of the game that we want to take into consideration. So draw game over. I'm thinking something simple probably. Maybe something like uh, in large, a really large font, um, just game over. And then below that in a smaller font, maybe your score was um, 8. And then if uh, you press enter on that screen, maybe we should be able to restart the game and then continue to be able to press escape to quit the game, right? So fairly straightforward. Uh, so let's go over to back to our update function and remember we have to set that to true, this game over variable to true. And then we need this game over variable to be stored somewhere. So I'm just going to store it up here with our other snake, or actually I'm going to store it with our score. So local game over equals false. Right? It should be false by default. M might hear that. Might be able to hear that alarm. Um, police alarm. Police siren. Um, now remake it in Scratch, says JP. Yeah, actually, that wouldn't be a bad... Um, that would not be a bad demonstration, maybe for folks taking CS50 um, for the first time. Well, I'll, have to, I'll have to take a look at that. I'm guessing it was you who said that they, you tried to make the, uh, the snake dynamically resized in Scratch, right? And you're, you said you were having a little bit of uh, difficulty there? No, on to LOL. Yeah, I, uh, some, a snake beginner game series might actually be compelling. Um, let's see. Uh, OK, so line 99. So if, uh, if we do intersect with a tile, snake body tile, right? If our snake head intersects, we can go to, we can um, set game over to true, and then we can sort of make this an else if, right? Because we don't want to check Apple if that happens. We basically want to change um, our flow of our logic from going to check for an Apple to just skipping that altogether and skipping this. Um, um, better yet, we can probably just return out of this, correct? If my logic is. Uh, if my logic is right, yeah, I think, I think we can just return. So basically cut this function short altogether, not actually worry about any of this other stuff. We don't need to do any of this. We don't need to update our timer or anything. Um, so what we can do, would we want to, would we want to update the head to reflect the collision? No, because we're probably just going to transition right into the game over screen. Um, although, what we could do to show that we got a game over is, uh, yeah, we could have it so that we, we have our game over uh, text above our, our grid so that we can see where we died. Because that way we can at least kind of see, oh, I have my, like, and we can see what our whole snake looked like before the game actually cut short. So I think I might want to do it that way. So maybe I don't want to return off of this. I just want to set this game over, track, game over flag to true. Um, I will want to update this tile snake head. And then I kind of want to wrap this whole entire thing in a condition. So if not game over, then, and then I'm going to indent all of this code Right? So all of this is only going to execute if we're not in a game over state. So if not game over, so if it's not the case that we are in a game over, which we trigger by this uh, intersecting with a snake body tile, our head intersecting with a snake body, um, 
do all of that stuff. Else, right? Else, if we are in a game over, um, actually, no, we're not going to need to do anything in that case. Um, our update's just not going to do anything at all when we get into a game over. And what we're going to do to break out of a game over is we're actually going to add another condition in our love.keypressed function. So I can say if uh, key is equal to enter or key is equal to return and um, uh, game over, then, or rather, uh, we'll do it this way. If game over, then if key is equal to enter or key is equal to return, then, and the or equal to return is a Mac thing, so Macs don't have an enter key. There, there is this called return, um, or rather, I think enter is shift return. But by default, people are going to hit a return, and on Windows, it's going to be enter. So we want to mix those two together. Then I can say, I kind of want to initialize everything again, right? So I can do initialize grid, and then I can set snake tiles, or rather. Uh, what I can do is I can say snake x snake y is equal to 1, 1, and then snake tiles is equal to a table with snake x snake y. So what this basically does is it initializes our snake. Um, I guess I can take this out, call a function called initialize snake, right? Come down here at the very bottom to function initialize snake. Paste those lines of code in there. So now we have um, uh, basically the just setting the snake x and snake y to 1, 1, and then also creating the snake tiles table, with ha which has that first element with snake x and snake y. And then back up at the very top, um, oh, I guess snake moving equals right. I guess I can, I can do that as well. So snake moving equals right. And then I can initialize snake here, which I don't need to. Well, I guess it's kind of superfluous at this point, but just for just for consistency, um, that should work. It's not necessary, but I could just declare all these variables as local snake tiles, local snake x, snake y, uh, local snake moving, but um, it at least gives us a clearer sense of what's going on when we're looking at our uh, load function. We could say, oh, initialize grid, initialize snake. What does that mean? Go to initialize snake. It means set the snake y to 1, 1, set the moving to right, and set the snake tiles equal to snake x, snake y. And then initialize grid. Remember, all initialize grid does is do a nested loop where it uh, basically creates a bunch of empty inner tables for our rows and then fills those for each column with a zero. So just an empty tile while also generating a new apple somewhere completely random. OK. So that's all done. So if game over. And we press enter or return. We can initialize grid and initialize snake again. Um, and then score should be initialized back to 0. So we basically want a complete fresh restart to the game. Um, so that's all pretty straightforward. The last thing that we should do, and it looks like we did do already, was uh, oh the draw game over function. Let's do that. Function draw game over. And actually, what we're going to do is we're just going to, if game over, uh, then draw game over. Because what we want to do, uh, actually, rather, rather, sorry, this goes afterwards. So we're going to draw the grid and the score. We're going to draw the grid and the score no matter what. But if it's the case that we are, uh, whoops, sorry, game over is not a function. Game over is a variable. If it is a game over, then we're going to draw the game over uh, layout on top of that. Right? And the draw game over function is going to be something as simple as um, love.graphics.printf. So there's a printf function, not just a print function. Um, we're going to say game over. We're going to take a x and a y. So we're going to say we're going to. This is going to be a little bit strange. This is how the printf function works. We're going to say at zero 
and then um, window height divided by 2 minus 32. Um, actually, what should it be? Minus 64. And then we're going to specify a padding width, or uh, I, I, an alignment width, rather, which basically says within this amount of text, I want you to format it based on the format specifier that we're going to say as the last argument. So I'm going to say um, uh, window width. That's it. So it's going to basically center it within the window width, starting at 0 all the way until window width. It's going to center it. And then I want to specify that it's centered. So that last parameter, that last argument to the function, is a string that can be left, right, or center. And so if it's left, it'll within the bounds of window width, it'll basically just draw it at that xy. If you say right, it'll basically pad uh, on the left side, or rather on the left side of your string, it'll pad it with uh, white space until the end of the, that window width variable, or the window width uh, size that we specify here. So you're basically specifying a left and a uh, right, kind of, with zero in window width. Um, it's more like a left and then a number of pixels uh, after that size. So basically, within the size of the window, I want to center this game over text. And then I want to also do the same thing with press enter to restart at zero window width. And then I want to do window width plus, uh, sorry, uh, window height divided by 2 plus uh, 64. And then window uh, plus 96, actually. And then window uh, width, and then center. And so what that's going to do is it's going to draw this string a little bit below. This is what the, 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 uh, the y value here, remember x is 0, and then y at window height divided by 2 plus 96. That's going to uh, draw the second string of text a little bit lower than the, um, than the game over string. But both of these strings are uh, not going to be large enough. So I want to make a large font, uh, like, an actual, like a really large font. I want to make a huge font, right? So that's what we can do here. So local huge font equals love dot graphics dot new font. And we're going to make this one 128 pixels, which is why I did the minus 64 pixels earlier for the drawing it on the Y, because we want to shift it up half of the size of the text so that it's perfectly centered um, vertically on our window. So I'm going to do that. Um, da, 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 da. So huge font gets that size. And then when I draw my uh, game over, which is down here, I want to do love.graphics.setfont to huge font. And then I want to love.graphics.setfont to large font here. right? So two separate sizes. I want the game over to be really big, and I want the, um, uh, the press enter to restart to be big, like the same size as our score, but not as big. So I'm going to save it. I'm going to run it. Let's see if this is working. So remember, this should now, I'm going to get my snake up to maybe a five or six uh, tiles, and then I'm going to try and intersect with myself. Oh, it worked. So game over. Press enter to restart. It's a, a little bit low uh, visibly that we can see in the, um, in the game view there. But um, that's because my window is a little bit shifted down just because my monitor resolution is a little bit funky. But this should be approximately uh, centered in the, in the game view. And if I press enter, uh, oh, right. One other important thing, when you press enter, make sure, uh, where is it, in our key pressed, Anybody want to want to want to predict what I messed up here in the game over in this condition here? What did I forget to do? I know you guys got this one. This is an easy one, but a simple mistake that I made. JP guy says whoops. JP guy says woohoo. Yeah, it's exciting. A little bit a uh, little bit of a mess up there, but let's see if anybody's got it. Well, the key is that I forgot to set game over to back to false. So now whenever I run the, uh, if whenever I press enter to restart, I instantly go into a game over equals false uh, thing. Is there a clear function? Um, Love.graphics.clear will work for that case, but it will just draw everything again. 
um, because in our draw function we have this loop. We, we basically have it saying draw the grid every time. The uh, initialize grid function uh, is here. Um, so what that should do is just set the grid equal to um, emptiness. So let's try that again. Let's make sure I'm bug free uh, beyond this in another way, hopefully. So if I move over here, oh, OK, enter your start, and then up. Oh, so it actually didn't reinitialize our grid. So now we have our old snake there, which isn't what we, uh, what we want ideally. But I can grab that apple from before, and now it's going to have two apples that are constantly joining. So this is, a, this is a bug, right? And I can probably keep doing this over and over again, and I'll have uh, basically infinite snakes. Um, and I can keep running into other snakes. So we're not clearing our grid quite appropriately. Um, and why is that? Let me see. Initialize grid. I thought I called initialize grid. Oh, oh, OK. That's why. That's why. So in our initialize grid function, um, what we're doing is we're not actually uh, clearing the grid uh, by setting everything to 0. We're actually adding new tables, new empty tables to the grid. What we need to do is say tile grid equals empty grid first so that it starts from f uh, completely fresh. Bavik's got it right, um, as we did last time. So let's try that one more time. I grab one more apple and then try to collide with myself. OK, boom. OK, so it's working perfectly. That's great. So yeah, something as simple as that. So the initialized grid, basically, it was, um, because it does this table.insert tile grid and a new empty table. And so that's just going to keep adding new tiles. New, uh, 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 it's going to keep adding new empty tiles to the end of the grid. And then for each of the t uh, tables that existed already, it's going to just add empty tiles beyond where we can visibly see, basically. Um, and so that's a bug. But what we've done now is we fixed that. So now that is no longer, excuse me, that is no longer an issue. JP guy, good stuff. Bella Kira says, great. Thank you. Yeah, it's been, it's nice seeing it all sort of come together. Um, OK, so we have a game over. We have a, uh, the ability to restart our game from scratch. So now we should think about um, collision, or not collision, rather, but the ability to sort of go backwards or to, to go in the opposite direction of where we're moving, which causes issues, right? Because then we're instantly colliding with ourselves. And we also get some weird rendering issue. Well, we won't anymore because we fixed the, we've made it so that we collide. Um, but we shouldn't be able to go backwards, basically. And so this part is actually pretty easy. If anybody wants to suggest anything um, as to how we can go about doing it, I suspect it's probably somewhere up here in the, uh, in the update function, right? So we have. The, um, the snake timer itself, checking whether we've gone past our, our, our speed variable, our speed constant 0 0.1. Um, and this is sort of where we check to see, oh, um, you know, uh, rather, 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 uh, up here in our love.keypress function. This is where we check the key. And if we're going left, we should move left. If we're going right, we should move right. If we're going up, we should move up. If we're going down, we should move down, right? Um, so here, we should all, all that it feels like we need to do, really, is just kind of change the conditions, right? So if the key is equal to left, um, and snake moving uh, is not, uh, rather, if snake moving not, um, or rather, not equal to uh, right. So if we're moving right and we press left, we shouldn't be able to go left because that'll be a reversal of our direction, right? Uh, same here. And snake moving is not equal. Whoops. Enable detection. No, I'll pass on that. Um, not equal to left. So this this tilde equals is uh, kind of the weird Lua way of doing not equals. In a lot of languages, you'll see it uh, like that, the amp or the uh, exclamation point equals. But in Lua, it's a tilde equal. That's not equals to. 
So if key is equal to up and snake moving is uh, not equal to down, uh, if key is equal to down and snake moving is not equal to up. So basically now we're saying if we're moving left, if we're moving, or rather if, our, if we're pressing left, right, and we're not moving right, so if we're moving up or down, basically, then move left. And same thing for all the other directions. Basically, uh, don't let us move in the opposite direction that we're already moving, effectively. So if I hit this and I try to move left, I actually can't. But I can move down, I, can move, uh, I can't move up, which is nice. But basically now, no matter what, I actually can't collide with myself. So we're in a state where um, the snake is, is incapable of going backwards and thus instantly colliding with itself. So the, that's kind of like the majority of uh, the snake features. Um, does anybody have any questions on what we've talked about thus far? Um, want me to step through anything in the code? Um, anybody have any uh, interesting features that think the game is missing? Um, we still have a couple hours left, so we could we could make we could do some more stuff. But we can also have some Q and A um, and sort of talk about uh, what's going on here with the code base. We could uh, we could also make a title screen before we start, right? So that's probably pretty straightforward. Um, let's see. Uh, we probably want to maybe have like a local game start equals true. It'll be like the, the beginning of the game, right? Because the game, the, what we can do is basically do an if statement kind of with the game over. If it's equal to game start, then just draw uh, welcome to snake, press enter to begin or whatever. Um, and then when we go from the game over back, we can just go straight to the, ga with the game start, not straight to the game, um, just so we can sort of... Um, uh, see what's going on in advance, right? Okay, cool. So game starts true. Um, da, da, da. This, um, by the way, this code here actually still, like we're still, I'm realizing now we can, we can still change the direction of our snake even when we're in game over. Not that it'll mean anything or it'll be visible, but this bit of logic here is always executing. So the better style would probably be if not game over, then do all this stuff, right? Um, and then we could probably make like an else here, but that's only in a in, in game over state. Probably we maybe don't want that to happen. Um, if game over or game start, though, that could work, right? Um, and then in our draw function, we could do something like if game start, draw like this is the beginning of uh, Welcome to Snake. Uh, wouldn't it be better to include the game over check in the initialize part? Uh, da, 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 da. The game over check in the initialize part. Uh, I'm sorry, JP. Would you explain? So you have to check for a game over at runtime. Um, um, not exactly. I mean, this is kind of a minor optimization at this point, just because this bit of code is just going to be constantly checking for conditions when we're in a game over. So it kind of makes sense to make one if statement and then um, be able to sort of get out of that if, we're, if it's the case that we're in a, um, in a game over, right? Because we don't want the, we, ideally you don't want lots of, I mean this is a small example and not, not really worth worrying about for this kind of game and it, does, it doesn't matter at all, but for a large bit of a large game with maybe more complicated input, you probably don't want it registering while you're in some state where it's completely irrelevant. Um, because in a, in a game over, ideally you're probably doing other things and displaying other things. And if you're taking input and using CPU cycles for things that aren't germane to the scene at all and are completely being wasted, it's just kind of, uh, just kind of messy, kind of unnecessary. 
Um, but for this, again, for this use case, it's a very simple thing. It's just worth mentioning just because I happened to notice it was there. Um, good question. The, oh, right. And then if uh, game start, then, uh, and then else. We can sort of put all this in the else because if we're in game start, um, we don't need to, um, if we're in the, bah, 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 these two, basically this game over and draw grid rendering stuff doesn't need to take place in the game start. We're just going to have, let's just have, assume we're going to have a black screen that just has snake and then press enter. Uh, we can store game over in a, uh, in a variable. When the game is over, we change into something else and check if that variable and game over start new window set initial stuff. Uh, yeah, that's, what we're, that's effectively what we're doing, correct. Yeah, the game over variable, which is the, we declare it right up here at the top. Game over is false. And then we even have a, a game start um, value. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, OOP in Lua. Yeah, we'll talk about that, actually. Um, we could maybe, um, there's a, so object-oriented programming in Lua is a bit weird by default. It uses these things called meta tables. Um, and the syntax is a little messy. But there's a really nice library that I use that allows you, and I teach this in the games course, that allows you to just use very simple syntax for declaring classes. Um, I think I'll introduce that in the, um, in the concentration stream on Friday, where we make the memory pair game. And we can maybe make some classes, like a card class, um, something like that. Um, but yeah, it's totally possible using using libraries. It's actually quite nice. Um, yeah. If the game is start, um, okay. So this is where we're actually rendering. Uh, we're going to render the, the 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 game start screen. So the very beginning when we start the game. If game start render snake at zero uh, virtual height divided by two minus sixty four because we want it halfway uh, in the middle of the screen vertically. Shift it up half of one twenty eight. Right. Um, we're going to take the padding width to be the window width. So we're going to center it within window width starting at zero. And then we're going to make sure it's in center mode. And then we're, we're going to do the same sort of thing that we did here, actually, um, except it's not going to be press enter to restart. It's just going to be press enter to start. Um, and then as before, actually, love.graphics.setFont. Remember, you have to set the font for whatever drawing operations you want. Because Love2D is a state machine, it's not a, um, it doesn't allow you to um, sort of draw with a font, I guess. You have to sort of set a font, draw, and then set a font, draw, etc. So if you forget to unset a color or a font or something, and, it, and rendering looks a little bit messed up, it's probably because you forgot to um, change the state machine to reflect whatever changes you want. Um, so if the game is started, blah, blah, blah. So that's working great. Um, and then if game over or game start, okay, so this is where it's actually going to, um, uh, we could do it this way, game start equals false. Game over and game start equals false. And then we could change from, yeah, actually this should work perfectly fine. So if we, oh, uh, <laughs> this should work perfectly fine, crash. Uh, oh, I didn't see what that said. Virtual, oh, vir I'm using virtual height. Sorry, I'm so used to writing virtual height as a, uh, as a uh, constant because I use that in my games all the time. But what I want is window height. So virtual, we'll look into virtual height as we get into some other more retro looking games um, because I like to generally program games to fit to sort of old retro console aesthetics. So like uh, the Game Boy Advance is a really good resolution, 240 by 160, I believe is what it is. And um, there's a library called Push, which I use in my games course, which allows you to sort of say, oh, I want my game window to be rendered like it's at X resolution, not like an actual native resolution. So I could say, oh, fire up a window that's 240 by 160 pixels, and, um, and that will, uh, it'll draw it just like that and scale everything, and it'll look like a nice retro game, pixel perfect, while also being the same size as a full windowed game. So you really do get that like zoomed in pixelated look. 
Um, and that's something that we, right now all we're doing is just squares, so it's pretty basic. We don't really need to worry about that too much. But if we get into like concentration, where maybe we have pictures of elements, or we get into maybe we make like a like a RPG or like a um, a Super Nintendo looking game or NES looking game or Game Boy Advance looking game, I think we could we should definitely uh, dive into that a little bit. Um, but we won't worry about that this time. We'll take a look at some more features on Friday. Um, so let's make sure that I have everything working. So I boot up the game. It says snake, press enter to start. I press enter to start. I'm going. I have my snake. Boom. 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 I can't crash into myself from going the opposite direction, which is really nice, but I can collide with myself just like that. I get into a game over state. I can press enter, and now I'm back into it. Just like that. So now we have multiple what are called game states. And uh, we'll also take a look going into the future at what are called state machines and what a state machine can let us do to sort of break um, apart our game into a little bit more modular and abstract components so that we can say, I want a, uh, I want a title screen state with its own update, its own render, its own you know, input detection. I want a play state, I want a game over state, I want all, like a start state, all these different things um, that sort of have enclosed blocks of functionality. Um, but for right now, our game is actually working pretty well. Um, I guess one thing that we could do, we could add, would be like static obstacles into our game, right? So I think Snake by default will kind of have um, just like random, I guess like I, I guess they'd be like brown obstacles, like almost like stakes in the ground or something, where you can't actually collide with them. Um, and if you do, it's game over, just like the body. Don't forget to plug your edX and GitHub stuff in the chat and in the description. Good point, JP. In case people don't catch the stream when it's live, that is a uh, that's a good point. I'll I'll make sure to edit that. Um, if anybody, oh, also good reminder. I'm going to push to my GitHub. So let's go, let's see, where am I right now? Dev, streams, snake. Okay, it should be that. So get status, get commit, um, uh, complete snake with title and start screens. I should have been committing a little bit better. Uh, get push. And I configured my git as well, because last week when I tried to do anything related to git, it was a little bit funky um, because it, I have what's called two-factor authentication um, enabled on my account, and that causes issues if you're uh, if you're using Git at the CLI. I added different levels in Snake and Scratch, and one of that I did stones. If Snake hit the stones, game over. Yeah, so we can do that. We can absolutely do that. Um, let me just refresh this. So now it's three commits. So if you go to the, whoops, let's go back just to the main.lua. If you go to the um, repo, so uh, it's this repo. Actually, I don't think I'm signed in. Uh, let, me, let me sign in here really quickly. Okay, am I not signed in here either? Stuff like that, uh, obstacles would be nice. Stuff like that with levels increased speed. Oh, the increased speed of the snake. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 correct. So, sorry, I'm gonna pop off camera just for a second here. Let's see, I should be signed in here, I think. Um, I apologize if uh, people were able to hear that audio. Uh, 250 followers on the C on the Twitch as well. That's awesome. And also, thanks for tuning in, everybody who's here now. Okay, let me just make sure we're at the right spots. Okay. All right, so that's the URL, uh, which we'll have the uh, GitHub. If you're curious, if you want to uh, grab that, get the latest commit, mess around with it a little bit, that's got all, all the stuff that we've looked at today. Um, let's 
go back to the monitor here. And um, right, obstacles. So currently, we have our title screen. We have the ability to move around. We have a score. Um, our background is a little bit boring. So uh, very simply, just using um, some code that we've already got, which is just our um, randomizing the um, uh, you can also program a Twitch bot for this stream live. That would be super meta, albeit not game related. Uh, yeah, that would actually be pretty cool. I'm not, I'm not familiar with twi uh, Twitch bot programming, but I'll definitely look at that because that'd be that'd be pretty cool actually. Yeah, very interesting. I'm assuming it's probably like JavaScript or something, um, which I am fairly familiar with, but not as much so as Python and Lua probably. Um, yeah, so we have the we have the uh, foundation laid. If we want to generate, like, let's say I want to generate stones, right? Let's say let's say I want like gray blocks generated randomly in my level, and those are stones. And if we collide with the stone, then that should trigger a game over just like colliding with my body, right? So. Where do I have the code for generating an apple? It's up here, right? Um, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take these two lines of code out here, and I'm going to copy them. I'm going to call a function I haven't written yet called generate, um, generate obstacle. And then it's going to take in a value, so tile apple in this case, right? And then I'm going to define some new constants. Oh, a new constant for now. Tile stone is four. I'm going to come down here at the very bottom where I have initial, all my initialized stuff. And just above my initialized stuff, I'm going to say function generate obstacle, um, obstacle. And I'm going to paste those two lines of code that I had before, which is just going to be um, setting a couple of variables, so obstacle x and obstacle y, um, same here. And then I'm going to set the uh, value at that actual index in the, um, in the tile grid to whatever the value is passed to me as the parameter obstacle. So now I can use this for anything. I can use this to generate random apples or stones or whatever other, um, what other, um, Tiles I might design as a designer. So else if tile grid y x. Um, this is the draw. By the way, this now I'm in the draw grid function, so I want to be able to render this appropriately. Tile stone, um, and this could be just like a kind of. Oh, I realize this doesn't need to be changed the color to uh, light green for snakehead. Had an outdated comma there. Um, this is going to be a light gray. Right, and so light gray is kind of like the, all the same numbers on the RGB, but just not one and not uh, not zero. So ideally higher. So probably like point. We'll say point eight. So I'll say love dot graphics dot set color 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, and then one for full opacity. Love dot graphics dot rectangle. Um, we just copied this line of code actually, and then paste it there, and the uh, the thing is, this is only going to generate an apple, generate an obstacle of an apple here. So this should still work, right? So it's going to generate an apple. I'm going to pick up the apple. It's going to generate a new one. That's fine. Uh, is it generating the apple up here as well? Oh, you know what it is? It's in the initialized grid, I think. Yeah. So. Back down in our initialize grid function, we can take out those two lines of code that were kind of the longer ones and just say initialize, or sorry, generate obstacle tile apple right here, just like that. So now it's a little bit cleaner, right? It's the same, same logic that we had before. Should just work right off the gate, which it does. And then I'm going to. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Figure out a place where I want to initialize some stones, and I can do it. 
Um, I can do it here in initialize grid actually because we're only going to want to initialize those stones every time our grid is sort of initialized from scratch, right? So I can probably do something as simple as for i equals 1 until 10, do generate obstacle tile stone, right? And if I run this, now I have 10 stone obstacles in my game but I can still collide with them and I actually overwrite them as a result of that. So we're kind of in the right spot. We're generating obstacles, but we still need to implement collision detection, right? It's not quite working yet. So uh, this was in our update function, I do believe. Uh, yes, here. So we can basically do a, uh, an or statement here and say or tile grid snake y snake x is equal to tile stone then do that so if I do this boom game over so we, we, we overwrote the stone there collided with it and uh, that's our game over so now we have obstacles randomly generated obstacles and we have uh, rendering and collision detection for them and so now we have sort of this idea of random levels. So pretty neat. Just messed around with it a little bit. Got to play test. It's an important part of the game. Make sure we have, don't have any bugs that we haven't anticipated yet. Let's try going from the other side, which looks good. The uh, only sort of thing that I would be conscious of is this apple is actually capable of uh, overwriting a stone because generating um, the generate obstacle function doesn't actually check to see whether the obstacle that we're overwriting, that index in the grid, is, a, um, is empty, right? So we should probably do that next, right? So, whoop, just like that. Pretty slick. Come through here. It actually looks pretty nice, I'm not going to lie. Very simple, but effective. I'd be curious to know, uh, with this code base, how high of a score folks might be able to get. I probably won't play for too much longer, but I sort of feel like I'm, I'm owed at least an opportunity to play it just for a couple minutes. Elias says, nice move, thank you. OK. So we'll just end it right there. All right, I tried to grab the apple at the last second, didn't work. Got a score of 24. All right, so the last thing we should take into consideration, like I said, is when we generate an obstacle, we should probably do this in a while loop. So we probably want to do whatever our generate obstacle function is, uh, generate those new xy pairs sort of infinitely um, until we get an empty tile in our grid and then we can uh, we can set it. So uh, let's just do um, do. I believe this is. The, I hardly ever use this. Do until uh, tile grid obstacle y obstacle x is equal to tile empty. So do until. I did levels based, uh, Bavik Knight says, I did levels based on scores. If the score reaches a number, it will up levels. That's a good idea. We could maybe mess around with that a little bit. Oh, yeah, that was another thing we were going to do. We were going to add um, sort of increased speed in the game, right? So making the, uh, uh, making the snake move a little bit faster the more points we get. So we should maybe figure that out a little bit. Um, that is as simple as just decreasing our snake speed constant. Right, which would therefore not make it a constant. It would make it a, just a regular variable. We can mess around with that a little bit. Um, so, but again, to cover what this syntax is, so on lines 223 here to 225, I'm using what's called a do until loop. Um, and in uh, C and some other and most other languages rather, it's called a do while loop. So I'm generating those two random values, the obstacle x, obstacle y, um, and I'm getting them as two random values. But I'm doing it until they're for sure an empty value in our table, right? I don't want to overwrite any uh, other tiles that might already exist, whether it's a, an apple or a stone or whatnot. So 
whether or if it's an apple even overriding the uh, the snake in the in the in the map, right? I don't want that to happen. That'd be buggy behavior. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just do that. So do until till tile grid obstacle y obstacle x is equal to tile empty, and then set that equal to the obstacle number that we passed into our obstacle function. So probably won't say oh. Uh, Oh, I think you do need an end after the until. Uh, end expected to close the do until. Uh, da, da, da. Let me ref I never use do until in Lua. Let me refresh my, my mind here a little bit. The syntax. Oh, it's repeat until, not do until. I'm sorry. OK, repeat until. There we go. Uh, main tw 227, attempt to index a nil value. Uh, generate obstacle. Is this taking place before? Oh, wait, hold on a second. Max tiles x. Equal to a nil value. Repeat local obstacle x, obstacle y. Oh, because they're local to here, I think. Yeah, that was it. So I declared obstacle x and obstacle y as local variables within this repeat uh, block. And so by doing that, basically, I was erasing these values as soon as I got to this until statement. So this, remember, there's a thing called scope in programming languages where um, if you declare something as local to something, anything outside of it has no access to it. So in order to generate these values, I have to declare them up here so that they're accessible not only within this block, but also within this, uh, within this condition here at the end of the repeat block. So a little bit of a gotcha um, just to be aware of. Um, but yeah, so there we go. Perfect. Those all clustered up towards the top. That's interesting. Um, OK. So Bavic Knight says, gave some lives to the snake initially. With the game over, it decreases, so players don't have to play forever. Yeah, that, that possibly uh, could work. Uh, Tmarg says, scoping in Lua seems weird, too. It is weird. It is really weird. Because a global variable is just any variable that you say like this, obstacle x equals 1, except in this case because I declared this as local already. But let's say I have some value called some foo equals 1. Um, some foo is going to be accessible anywhere in the, um, anywhere in the whole project. Um, it's, it, it's a little bit of a black sheep in terms of programming languages in a lot of ways, this being one of them, because a lot of languages don't give you this sort of global scope. Um, like in Python, for example, you declare variables without some sort of specifier. You actually have to declare global as a keyword in Python for it to have the same kind of behavior. But uh, in Lua, just declaring a, va a variable like this in any function or any block makes it available everywhere throughout your entire application, right? And that's a, that can be a source, um, like Tmarg is saying, had lots of trouble with it in the Mario assignment. That can cause a lot of issues. Um, so it's best practice to definitely keep your local variables isolated as much as you can. Even at the top of my module up here, I have a lot of these global constant values. Um, but all of my actual gameplay values are kind of just being uh, declared as local, even though they are functioning as global variables for this module. Um, but at least this way, if I have some other file that imports this main.lua, it's not going to add these symbols to the scope of that project. It would be, um, it would be a, uh, it would be a difficult thing to debug potentially. Um, Bavic Knight says, if you want to take a look, it was years back, doesn't grow dynamically. Sure, why don't we do that? Let's go ahead and take a look at Bavic Knight's, uh, uh, Bavic Knight's. Twitch project, if it will, if I can open it here. Should, should still be silent, hopefully. Um, ba -ba -ba.
Bavik, would you mind uh, spamming that in the chat one more time so I can see it in the live chat on my, on my window here? Or if anybody minds uh, copying and pasting the link into the uh, lorem ipsum nonsense data, it's Scratch. Can you uh, can you paste the link again in the chat just so I, I can see it live? I think uh, I think I can scrub back, but just offhand it's probably faster to. Uh, there we go. Now I just wanted the I just wanted the URL, Bavik. All right, let's do it. Is there is there sound, Bavik? Should I enable sound? Oh, there we go, yeah. We can start with three to four stones and then each level increase the number of stones but limit that number. Yeah, absolutely. That would be an example of, uh, you know, sort of easing your player into it, just a game design um, decision. All right. I have, I have sound enabled. All right. Let's test this out here. All right. Welcome to Snake World. Press spacebar to start. Use the arrow keys to play. Good luck. Oh boy. Oh, you have continuous snake. That's why. Yeah, that's. It's a lot harder to do it uh, in like a, a continuous fashion because you have to you have to have a bunch of basically squares that are chained together rather than having a. Um, rather than having a grid that we used. So we used a grid for that purpose. Um, yeah, very good. And I'm guessing you get to a certain point and then you, you increase the level in here. Is that what it is? Hey, I mean, you have the basics. Oh, there we go. Oh, different level. OK, I see. I see. All right. Oh, and it's faster. OK, so you have a lot of the, the mechanics there, right? The uh, Sort of the level, you know, the difficulty increasing in some fashion. I can't actually hear if there's if there's music currently, so I was. Uh, oh, you know why I screwed up? Okay, I know what what it was. It's because I had that on. Sorry. Let me t turn my monitor on really quick. Okay, that's what that is. Oh, go, oh boy. Oh. It took my input out of the. Uh, I think because I, I closed the Twitch the Twitch tab, it took my input out of the. Uh, it took my input out of the uh, scratch window here. But it's very good. No, uh, good job, Bavik, on that. Um, I would say I I don't blame you too too badly for you know having the. Um, not having the growing functionality because it's uh, it's uh, it's harder to do with a continuously moving square that's not axis aligned, or rather, it's not discreetly aligned within your your grid. Um, because collision detection is then you have to do what's called axis aligned bounding box detection, which we cover in uh, in the GD50 course. But it's uh, it's more work. It's not super easy, so I don't blame you. But no, good job. Um, good job on that. I'm curious if I don't remember offhand if, Twi or if uh, sorry, Scratch actually lets you um, do collision detection. I think it does. It just has collision detection built in, so you can just kind of move it around. So you just have a list. Um, yeah, enabling sound might cause copyright issues. Oh, JP guy, good point. Ah, crap, I didn't think about that. Okay, hopefully not. Um, worst case, YouTube will just quiet that part out. I might be able to silence it myself when I when I um, when I uh, cut the video and push it to YouTube, which will, it'll go to YouTube, by the way. Um, uh, there is sound, blah, 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 da, 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 rip. Rip, yep, rip. Have fun. It was, I tried, but I didn't have an idea. That's where I started coding. Yeah, no, I, I totally understand. It's not an easy problem to solve by any stretch of the imagination, so no worries there. All right. Well, we could do something similar to that. We could, uh, we could start with the 
um, difficulty thing, which Bella Cures uh, provided as well as a suggestion. Twitch might silence it automatically. That happens sometimes, but you won't get flagged or anything. Yeah, yeah, hopefully nothing. It should be nothing serious, yeah. Um, OK. So if we're going to do this difficulty thing, what we can do, uh, I think we'll just start off with like a difficulty equals like 1, maybe. Or level is equal to uh, Level is equal to 1, right? And then, uh, then what we can do is basically say for i equals 1 until level times 2, maybe? And then uh, maybe set the speed equal to 0.1 minus, uh, whoops. We'll do it here, right? And then uh, snake speed is equal to 0.1 minus uh, level times 0. Uh, 0. Let's see, what do we want it to do? 0, 1? Will that work? No. So math.min. So at the very, uh, oh, no, rather math.max, between 0 0.01 and 0 0.1 minus level times 0 0.01. So what this is going to do, make it go exponentially. Uh, yeah, that, that'll end up in disaster really quick. Um, now we'll do, a, we'll do a linear function on that for now, I think, just to. Uh, to keep it uh, to keep it sane, what I'm doing now with snake speed was I use this function called math.max, which returns the greater of two values. So basically, what I'm doing is I am taking either 0 0.01 being the lower bound. So the the slowest or the, sorry rather the fastest our speed will be is 0 0.01, which is really fast. Um, and I'm doing 0 0.1 minus level times 0. Uh, 0, 0.01. So 0.11 minus level times 0 0.01. So this is going to take the greater of these two values. So as level gets higher, this value will get higher. So it'll be 1 times 0 0.01, 2 times 0 0.01, 3 times 0 0.01, which will effectively be 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03. Um, and it'll subtract from this value, 0.11 until it gets to be the value of 0.01, in which case math.max is going to see that 0.01 is actually greater than this value and will always return 0.01 no matter what level we're on. So that's how we can sort of cap the lower bound on our speed. And we can do the same thing at the very bottom where we have, let's see, where is it at? Here, where we have level times 2. We don't want this to keep increasing infinitely because eventually we'll have so many stones that we won't be able to actually uh, function. So let's say the most we're going to have um, is, what's a, what's a good number, maybe 50 and uh, level times 2. So math.max, or sorry, math.min is the opposite of math.max and we'll turn the lower of two values. So it'll start off at level times 2 being 2 and as level increases we'll eventually get to a higher and higher point at which time we will exceed 50 if someone's good enough. And once we have exceeded 50 stones, 50 will be the lower value of this. And we'll, oh, this function, math.min, will always return 50. And so this is how we can clamp our value to be a certain amount. And once we, uh, to actually get to the next level, we want to check basically um, that we've eaten a certain number of apples, right? Uh, which is let me see, where is it at? Da, da, da. This part right here. So in our update function, when we check to see that we are eating an apple, what we want to do is increase our score as we did usually. And then it's here that we want to say if score is greater than some amount, let's say uh, level times 
2, or level times 4. Should it be level times 4? Mm, level times 3. If it's greater than level times 3, um, and we're going to math.min uh, 30 and that. So we'll always be looking for at least, oh, rather, uh, no, that, that won't work. Uh, because score is not going to get reset to zero, so this won't work. Um, oh, I guess it actually will, right? Yeah, we'll do we'll do level times three. That's easier for now. Our score is cumulative, so. Um, mm, We can make this an exponential function. So we can say this. I think this will work. So we'll say score is greater than level times half of level times 3. So it's kind of, it's kind of exponential. Um, so it's going to be 1 times. Uh, 0.5 times 3, in this case, 1 times math.max of 1 and level divided by 2. So in this case, we want to make sure that it's at least 1, because if level by default on the level divided by 2 on the first one is going to be 0 0.5, which won't work. Um, that'll be 0 0.5 times 3, which will be 1.5, which will be a number. It'll, it'll work, but. Not as, it's not as clean. So we're going to basically say level times math.max of 1 level divided by 2, which will get uh, bigger and bigger, but at slightly less of an increased rate than a purely exponential function. And then we'll multiply that times 3, just as some, uh, some value. Oh, math.ceiling, correct. Yeah, 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 we'll do that. We'll do that. Math.ceiling. Good suggestion, Bavik. Math.ceiling level divided by 2. I think we even talked about that last week. Perfect. Um, so now that'll never be a fractional value. It'll always, well, it'll be a fractional, well, no, it will never be a fractional value. Um, so if it is greater than that value, we're going to increment the level. We're going to then initialize the level. And I wonder, if it'd be worth having like a press, uh, press uh, space bar to start thing, just like Bavik had. Or we could just jump into it. But I think the level transition, if they're not ready for it, will be a little jarring. So I think it makes sense to kind of have like a screen that says, oh, you're starting level X. Um, press space bar to start the level. And then if they press it, then it'll start. So I think that's what we want to do. In that case, then do I also want to do this? One thing that I noticed that before we had was that when I did uh, when we had game over, we were actually moving the snake into the next obstacle or whatever it was, and it was kind of making it hard to see what we collided. Like we couldn't see that we collided with the stone. So I can say, if not game over, then do all this stuff right where we uh, basically change the um, where we change the um, uh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, sorry, if it's not a game over, then we can like go ahead and move our head forward and make the body the last tile. Um, and then if it is a game over, what's going to happen is it'll, it'll stop before it gets to this point, and then we won't actually see, uh, we won't overlap that obstacle because it was, um, it'll just make it a little bit easier to see what's going on. 
Metal Eagle says, CS50 TV, what language are you using for this? I apologize if you answered it already, just came in the stream. No problem, uh, thanks for joining us. This is Lua, and we're using a framework called Love2D. So you can go to love2d.org, um, which this isn't the correct page. Love2d.org, which will give you the list of installers. We're using, uh, using version 11.1 .1 here. Um, if you're running a Windows, Mac, or a Linux machine, there's different distributions here, and other versions as well over here. Uh, they have a great source of documentation at the very bottom right. You can click Love. You can see a few simple examples here on that main page. And if you have a GitHub account, um, or even if you don't have a GitHub account, you can download the repo for today's code at github.com slash coltonoscopy slash snake50. So thanks for popping in. Um, OK, so if it's not a game over, what we want to do is, um, yeah. Don't overwrite the next tile. I want to be able to see that I collided with the stone, if that's the case. Uh, no problem, Metal Eagle. Thanks again for joining us. Let me know if you have any more questions. Um, OK. So we did that. So that'll fix that bug. So actually, I could probably run this now, except not on 130. Oh, because level is, it's up here. Local level is 1. On line 130, we're setting level equal to Level plus one. Oh, I didn't put a then statement. Got to do that. That's important. So let's make sure that this is working now. Can I actually collide with that stone? Boom. Perfect. So now we collide with the stone, and it doesn't actually overwrite the stone. We can see it when we collide with it, which is just a little bit cleaner. Um, we can visually see what's going on a little bit better that way. Oh, and notice, by the way, we only got two obstacles instead of, uh, instead of the bajillion obstacles that we had before. So this is great, right? And the, um, the actual um, code to trigger for the next level isn't executing yet because we haven't, actually, uh, we haven't actually tested for that. Or we've tested for it, but we haven't actually, um, like we're incrementing the level, but we're not actually initializing the grid to anything new or doing anything else. So we should probably do that. Um, and display the level. Yes, good point. We can do that up here, actually. So if I go to love.draw, and then draw a grid, and then print the score. Where I have print the score, I'm actually going to copy that, do this. I'm going to print the level. And I'm going to do love.graphics.printf. And I'm going to set this to uh, 0, 10 pixels. A virtu or, sorry, window width, and then I'm going to set this to right. This is now right justified. It's not center justified. And uh, this is going to help us out um, by right padding it for us so we don't have to worry about it. So now we have level equals 0 right there, which is perfect. And um, it's right on the right edge, so it doesn't quite work as well. So I'm going to uh, set window width minus, um, maybe minus five, minus ten, or no, I'll just set the I'll just set this to negative ten at window width, and that should have the effect. Yeah, perfect. So set the start value of negative ten. So we're shifting the amount that we're centering or right aligning by negative ten, and we're still keeping window width. So it's basically just shifting this right aligned label to the left, just a, just a hair. So that way it aligns better with the 10-10 uh, the that we have up here with our other score. It's 10 pixels from the left edge. <laughs> Vanishil says, slick hair, bro. Thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Um, all right. So we have our level. And we actually see that the level is incrementing if I did everything appropriately. Although level is 0 for some reason, which I'm not. Uh, why is level 0? Oh, it's because it's the same value as score. Right. Let's not do that. Let's two string level. Right, And now, level 1, OK, perfect. Let's try to get a few apples, see if it increases. Oh, perfect. So when we got to score 4, it did increase to level 2. And uh, there's a, I was, I was going to say there's a, um, a uh, case to be made for just increasing the level while you're playing and um, adding more obstacles 
in the game. But that could potentially be a big source of frustration if like an obstacle generated right in front of your snake as you're moving. So probably not, probably not the best design decision. Uh, you definitely don't want to frustrate your player base. Uh, but we're on level three now, which is nice. Snake is looking good, level four. OK, so it's, it's working. Um, I didn't check to see whether speed was updating, which I don't think it is. Oh, right, because we're not updating it. Uh, yeah, we're not updating it, so we can do that. We're going to need to do that, right? So level increased by one. Uh, speed, make sure to set that appropriately. So we want to remember it's a, it's a function of our level, whatever our current level is. Um, we have the level, we have level incrementing, we have the speed adjusting. We need to have the screen that shows us whether we are, uh, what level we're on basically and allow us to press space to actually start the game. So we're going to need a new variable for that probably. And the, uh, what I generally like to do is kind of just have like a game state variable that will sort of keep track of it as a string. I pause for three to five seconds on the level increase, and then they know it's going to get tough. Yeah, yeah, that's, that could work too. Um, let me see. So game start, so local new level equals true. We'll just say we're going to have a new level a variable, which means that you know, we're going to basically let them press spacebar to uh, continue. Um, if new level, then we're going to check for space here. So if key is equal to space, then um, uh, da, 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 da. new level, we'll say new level equals false. And we'll set it to true by default, which we did. Um, T, uh, T Mark says, with obstacles, you still have to make sure they generate in a fair way. Yeah, so um, part of that algorithm would be, um, I guess there's a few ways you could, you could look at it. I guess what I would probably do is, since the character is going to always start in the top left, I would make sure that the... Um, algorithm makes the apples or the obstacles sort of spawn beyond like maybe five tiles in the in, a, in every direction um, as by just comparing whether the X or the Y is greater than or equal to five but uh, yeah there, there are situations where it could potentially create like a, a wall completely in front of the character which would be a little bit trickier to uh, solve a wall, I guess, like kind of in the direction the character is going. But thankfully, since you can kind of wrap around with Snake, it's not as big of a deal. We can maybe look at that. Uh, we'll run it a few times and see if that's an issue that we run into. But that's a good. That's a good thing to. Um, it's a good thing to anticipate before you you're, you release the game. Um, just because, yeah, you could you could have some scenarios where you just get really screwed over by obstacles. Um, yeah, as just like you said, you could conceivably make it so they spawn away from the player or something. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Uh, did we check that apples and stones don't overlap? Yes, uh, because now in our generate obstacle function, remember we have this repeat block. It'll basically ensure that anytime an obstacle is generated, and remember obstacle is both our apples and our, our stones, if, uh, if this function is called with any obstacle as, a, as an argument, it will um, uh, it will make sure that it's empty always because this will repeat obstacle x, obstacle y gets two random values until um, those that obstacle y and obstacle x in our tile grid is equal to tile empty. So by virtue of that logic, we'll never have an overlap in our uh, in our obstacle generation. Good question. Uh, okay, so the screen, the start screen. Da, 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 da. So if we're at a new level, uh, we're going to wait for a space press to get to a new level, right? Um, Bavik says, cool. And ba, ba, ba. Our drawing mode is 
right here, game start. Uh, what we want also is um, new level, right? So else if new level, then love.graphics.set font. Uh, mm, we'll just make them both large fonts in this case. Um, love.graphics.printf. We're going to say, um, actually, no, we do want a huge font. This is going to be level and then two string level. Zero window uh, height divided by two minus 64 window width center. And then love.graphics.set font. And then, OK, and then we'll just do press enter to start. And then we have to set it to large font. OK, so this should start a, uh, yep, level one. So press enter to start. Um, but we can't see the level in advance. So what I probably want to do is um, basically in here is where I want this, actually. So so if, uh, if we're at a new level, we're going to, where we've drawn the grid already, so we can then draw the, um, the level text and the press enter to start label. And then if we're in a game over, we'll draw a game over instead. So both of those will occur on top of the grid with the score and the level currently displayed um, on top of the uh, left and the right. Actually, we don't, want the, we don't want the score and the level, I think, drawn up top when we're, do we? Uh, I guess it doesn't matter that much. But we could take that out if we wanted to. Um, OK, so that should, we should be able to then draw the, um, uh, if not game over and not uh, new level, then blah, blah, blah. So remember, we need to make sure to check for not new level as well because we don't want it to update. We don't want the world to update if we're not in a new if we're uh, uh, if we're in the the new level screen, right? See if this works. So level one. So we do have the. Um, oh, whoops. For some reason, the snake's not drawing. Okay, press enter. Oh, right. Oh, because it's spacebar, not enter. But why is the, it's interesting, the snake actually didn't get set in the initialize grid. Oh, because we didn't call initialize snake in the, um, oh, right, what well, we did. Oh, no, we, what we did is we didn't do this. We didn't do this here. That's very important. That should be part of the initialize snake function, actually, probably. Um, but now, and also, it's not enter to start. It should be space to start, probably. Um, let's see if this actually, if the level generate, if the level transition works. I'm not sure if it does just yet. Nope, it doesn't work yet. Okay, so that's okay. So I'm going to update that label because I say it says uh, press enter to start. It should be press space to start uh, for the this part. Press space to start. So now it that is correct, not enter. Um, and then what we can do next is determine whether we are in a new level, which is this here, right? So we increase the level, uh, decrease the snake speed, but we need to actually do um, new level equals true. And if new level equals true, then I believe we should just return. So we're moving around. OK, level two, press space to start. The, uh, the tricky part about this is that it's not actually displaying the next level. 
So that's kind of what we want, right? We're going to press space to start. And oh, it actually kept the exact same level, and it didn't, and it didn't spawn a uh, an apple. Okay, that's a that's a bug. So, oh, is it because we didn't generate obstacle tile apple here? Probably. New level is true. Oh, I guess I guess we could uh, I guess we want to generate that here then. Okay, new level is true. Initialize grid. Uh, initialize snake, and then uh, let's just bring this line of code to the initialize snake function because it belongs in there, right? Okay. All right. Let's see if that works. Now we're going to initialize the uh, we're initialize the grid from scratch as soon as we um, as soon as we get to the next level. Ah, okay. Level two, and now we have four obstacles, so we're on our or on the way. We press space, and there we go. And I do feel the snake is actually moving a little bit faster now. Uh, okay. So my math doesn't work out here. Okay. So the two. Okay. So our score exceed. Our score is at seven. Um, we went straight to level three, which is fine. But I think I need to tweak my. Uh, I think I need to tweak my algorithm a little bit for the score. That's OK. It's a little bit better this time. OK. Let's try this out. There we go. Seems to be working pretty well. We have obstacles. We have um, we have uh, the score, uh, the first two levels, the math there is a little bit screwy, so that's OK. Um, but this all works pretty well. We have, the, we have levels, we have the speed going up, we have the obstacles generating. They're, they look like they're getting higher, getting more obstacles. Um, so this, this is working out pretty well. Uh, the one thing that I do recognize about the game, which kind of sucks, is that there's no sound at all. Um, so I think it'd be kind of cool to like dive into sound a little bit. Um, before we do, does anybody have any questions or want to talk about anything on the stream? Um, anything that we have done? I'm also going to commit this, by the way. Um, snake working with levels. So if anybody wants to clone or you know grab the code, the zip, or clone it, you can um, you can get it at the GitHub. So once again, github.com slash coltonoscopy slash snake50. There should now be four commits on there. The most recent commit has all of the stuff that we just added. It's actually getting pretty long. It's like uh, 200, like 300, almost 300 lines of code. Granted, a lot of this could be uh, cleaned up a bit. Um, we're doing this live. We're not really taking a super hardcore engineering approach to this as our first stream. Later streams will be a little bit better about this. Um, but this is a little bit more kind of, I guess, haphazard, kind of like do as we go and not think about it as much. Um, but it's coming along really well. So yeah, I think the next step that I'd like to do is get a little bit of sound going. And so I think like probably the first thing I would do is um, probably add like a sound effect for eating an apple, right? So whenever we have an apple, just play like a little blip or something. So one of the programs that I like to use a lot for this is called BFXR or BFXer. Um, and I think it's called the same thing or CFXer on a Windows machine. But it's a, that's not correct. It's a f uh, free sort of sound generating program. I'll try to pull it up here, BFXR. BFXR.net. So you can download it for Windows or Mac. Apologies if you're on a Linux machine. Um, SFXR might have a Linux build, maybe. It looks like they have a yeah they have a Linux build for the SFXR um, one. Want to give some lives to players and on game over it decreases and on no lives it ends and it would be like a real snake games. Yeah 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 we could we could definitely do something like that too. Um, just like a uh, sorry that's on my eye a little bit of a uh, a live based approach that they don't die and lose all their progress right off the gate and you could even have something like 
where if they pick up enough apples or something, they actually increase their, their live counter. That's something they could totally do as well. Um, but for now, let's see what time is it. It's, uh, it's 5.06. We have a little bit less than an hour. We have some more stuff we can mess around with here. Um, let's go ahead and uh, to BFXR, if you're, if you're looking at it, I'm just going to generate a few sounds. This might be loud. Okay. That didn't sound quite good enough. Notice that there's a bunch of little buttons up here, so you can generate like different categories of sounds, like pickups, lasers, power-ups. Um, yeah, we've got some weird sound effects here. That one wasn't bad. Kind of like a Mario, uh, like a Mario coin almost. I'm going to export a wave. Uh, going to go to where I have it saved. Dev streams snake, and then um, we'll just call this um, Apple .wave. So wave files are generally what you um, use to. Uh, or what a lot of sound editors will export as their first sound. Um, yes, it was there as well, like one-ups. Now we're going retro. Yes, yes, this is, this is the good stuff. I just did Mario sounds in Scratch, totally. Yeah, Mario sounds are what's up. Yeah, I love, love Mario sounds. Um, doing sounds in Love 2D is actually really, really easy. So we can go, let's see, up here where I have my fonts. Now, normally, I would have a, a separate file that has all of my fonts, all of my graphics, all of my sounds, all that stuff in a sort of like a dependencies or a resources file. But for right now, we're just going to have a, uh, we're just going to declare them up here. So local apple sound equals love dot audio dot new source. And I'm going to call it apple dot wave. And I'm going to go over to where I pick up the apple. Because that's the actual sound object. So now we can hit play, pause, and all that sort of thing on that object. You can even loop it, which wouldn't be very good for that kind of sound effect. But you would want it for something like a music track, which maybe we can add a music track as well. Got something in my eye again. Ugh, ouch. OK. Um, where we find the apple, right here. So increase the score and generate a new apple. We're also going to play a sound effect. So I'm going to go to. Um, Apple sound colon play. Colon operator is uh, kind of like an object oriented operator. Um, it basically uh, calls some function with self, the self word, um, the self value plugged in as the first parameter. Um, and that's kind of the way that Lua does its object oriented programming. And a lot of these Lua objects are um, these, uh, uh, sorry, love 2D classes and objects work with this colon operator. We haven't implemented any of our own classes, but we'll see this in the future with future streams, possibly even on Friday when we do concentration. Um, but for now, it suffices to say that in order to use the sound objects play function, I need to use this colon, not a period. Make sure you use a colon. And so once I hit uh, run, uh, string expected, got no value. Oh, and then um, you need a, sorry, you need a second value on your Apple sound in this case. And it needs to be a string that specifies whether we're using static or streaming. Uh, everybody uh, give a shout out to, to David J. Malin in the stream there, everybody. Trolling. Uh, hard Denmark, is this live? Yes, this, this is, this is live. Uh, may or may not possibly be uh, the real David J. Malin, who knows? Actually, I think it is. He's messaging me right now. Uh, this is what called This is what I'm up to in the writer's room. Everybody's giving me a shout out here. Okay, awesome. Thanks for joining us, Hard Denmark. Um, yeah, Bavik Knight. Yeah, Professor is here. Yeah, everybody, everybody, throw some kappas in the stream for for David J. Malin. Throw, throw a few kappas in there. Um, right. So the thing we were missing from the Apple Sound function call was the static string. So you need some string value in order to. Uh, there we go. There we go. Cosmin HM joining as well. Um, basically, what static tells this audio source object is, am I going to store this in memory, or am I going to stream it from disk? If you store it in memory, it's going to obviously take up more memory, but it's going to be faster access. Um, for something like a music track, or for a lot of music tracks that you don't necessarily need right off the gate, you can declare them as, I believe it's streaming, or something similar to that. But static 
is a string that will allow it to be just kind of like stored in memory permanently so your game kind of has instant access to it, right? So I do that, and now we have snake running again. It's no longer broken. If I hit space to start here and I pick up the apple, if all is going well, it works. Perfect. So that's audio. That's uh, how to make sound effects in your game. Um, yeah, I, su I suppose maybe we could add a uh, like a, a victory sound when we uh, when we go to another level. So I'm gonna open up BFXer again, and maybe we'll mess around with uh, let's say some of the power up sound effects. Probably not that one. That one's pretty good. We'll, we'll use that one. We'll export that as uh, new level dot wave. And then, just like we did with this other one, I can say new level sound is love dot audio dot new source new level dot wave. We'll make this one static as well. And these wave files, because they're sound effects, they'll be pretty small. Um, so declaring them as static isn't a big deal. But again, larger, longer audio sources probably want to declare them as streaming. Um, let's confirm in the love. This is a good chance to look at the love wiki, by the way. We can go to love.audio. Uh, love.audio.newsource right here. And then the type. Yep, source type streaming or static. Uh, it's stream. So the stream would be uh, stream. Oh, and this is an interesting feature. I'm actually not aware of this. There's a new queue function. Audio must be manually queued by the user with source queue since version 11. Um, OK, I'll have to take a look at what that actually means and if that's any use. But for right now, the two main ones that have historically been with Love2D are static and stream. So again, smaller versus kind of larger. Or even if you have multiple levels in your game and you don't necessarily need all the sound effects or all of the, um, the music for that sound effect loaded up uh, right away, you can declare them as streaming. Or you can just dynamically unload and load the objects. Uh, if you have just a finite set of them, a smaller finite set of them. OK, so we have our new level sound effect. So wherever we declared that we um, uh, reach a new level, which was in our update function, should be um, right here. So this is if the score is greater than level. And we used our math.ceiling, level divided by 2 times 3, our little pseudo uh, exponential function. I'm going to go ahead and do what we did before, new level sound colon play, which will play that new level sound whenever we do reach that score threshold and we go to a new level. We'll try it out here. Whoops. And again, you can't, I can't move backwards anymore, which is, which is good. That's the behavior that we want. But I sort of instinctively almost want to do that. OK. So there we go. So as soon as we cleared the level, we went, uh, we played not only the Apple sound effect, but also the, the, the new level sound effect. So we have kind of like this more robust um, game. Uh, or we have this more robust sort of sensory feedback system in our game. It's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more polished. I'm going to go ahead and add everything to the project, um, commit it um, as sound effects for game for snake. I'm going to push that. So now, if you clone that or download that, you'll see um, you'll see those new sound effects in the repo. And when you run it, you should be able to to play them as a result. OK. Um, one other feature that I really like to add to games typically is uh, like a music track or something like that. So I think that might be like another nice feature to add. Uh, if anybody has any questions on what we've done thus far, definitely throw them in the chat. I'll be, I'll be looking back and forth. Um, for now, I think I'll pull up a, I'll pull up an audio, I'll pull up a, a music track from one of the other classes that I, or one of the other course examples that I did just because I know it's a free song. Um, let's go into, this is a Unity project, actually. You resources, so sounds, I don't remember. Oh, I think I had it in music here. Let me just make sure this isn't too loud. That's not bad. We'll use that. That was a free, that was a free music track I pulled off of, um, uh, I believe freesound.org, 
which uh, a lot of great material there, by the way. I don't know if I pubbed them last time. Freesound.org, lots of free audio samples. You can go there. Um, you do need an account, I believe, to download them, but this is great for prototyping like game stuff. I use it all the time. And also opengameart.org is a great site to download free sprites and other resources and art. We'll use this in the future when we make other games. I might even see if they have uh, like cards that we can use for um, concentration on Friday because that will give us a chance to actually work with sprites. And sprites are a little bit um, more nuanced to deal with than, um, than shapes. Uh, and you have to do, uh, you have to split them up in what are called quads, if, especially if they're actually um, like this, this picture, for example. If your images are actually stored kind of grouped together on one image, you want to split it up into, into squares. But more on that on the next stream. For now, I'm going to take that uh, music file that I copied. I'm going to go into my repo and we'll call this just music.mp3. It works the exact same way as the other sound effects do. So local music so, uh, sound, you would love to audio.new source, music.mp3, static as well. And then the thing about music is it's a little bit different because we kind of want it running the whole time that we're playing the game. So I can do something like, um, what did I call it? I call it music sound. Music sound dot set looping to true. And music sound colon play. And now if I start the game, we have uh, music. And you can still hear the other sound effect on top of it. I think they're in key. They sound like they're in tune with each other. But yeah, that's how you get uh, music in your game. Uh, so now we have a pretty layered little snake demo there, right? We have all the major pieces. We have the, the sound effects for actually picking up apples, which is important. We have the, the music. So now we have sort of everything um, that most games would have, um, with a few exceptions. We're missing, um, for example, persistence of high score. So that's something that we can look at in the future when we look at save data. So saving your high score to some text file so that you can remember it later. Um, the, I think one of the features we were going to look at was um, taking the, or having a uh, 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 lives, right? Yes, exactly, like Bavik says, are we gonna do lives? Yeah, we can take a look at that. We have uh, about 40 minutes left, so we might as well. Um, Bella Kira says, awesome, thank you. So, let's think about that. So, we can look at, we can have lives. Uh, I'm guessing we'll just keep it here with the, um, we'll keep it here with the game over and the other sort of state variables that we're using to keep track of what state we're in. So local lives, let's just say we get three lives by default. Um, and just to test our view out a little bit here, let's, um, let's draw that in the top center right here. So love.graphics to set color 111. Um, we don't actually need that. Right, um, we're gonna we're gonna keep this. I'm gonna just add another um, another string similar to this one, the level one, and I'm going to make this lives. So, we're, by the way, if we didn't talk about this before, this dot dot is the how you add strings together in Lua, the concatenation operator. So lives colon space dot dot to string lives because you can't concatenate a string and a number. So in case we didn't, in case we missed looking over that detail, um, but I'm going to set the first element to zero, uh, ten off the Y, so it's a little bit below the top of the screen. Window width and then center. So we're, we're going to center the string. It's going to be at the very top middle. It's not going to be at the left or the right side like we did before. So let's go ahead and run this. Perfect. So we have lives three at the top middle of the screen. Um, and that's it. So we don't, we don't really have anything much else to show for that because we haven't actually implemented the logic for um, losing lives, which you should do. 
So let's take a look at how we would do that. So normally, if we detect that we um, collided with a snake body, we just set the um, or a snake body or stone, we just set game over to true. But what we can do instead is we can say if uh, if lives greater than two, we're going to say, or rather, we'll set lives equals lives minus one. If lives greater than zero, what we want to do is we want to start them off again at the beginning, right? So what we can do is we can say uh, new level equals true, um, else um, game over equals true. And now I believe this might work as is. Okay, so we rode we uh, we rode over that um, we rode over that uh, stones. So there's a little bit of a flaw in our in our logic, our rendering logic for that piece, which we can um, we can add an, another if statement at the bottom of that update function to sort of take care of that. But it still says we're at level one. If we press space, uh, oh, it doesn't restart us actually. So that's another thing we probably want to do. Oh, that's going to be tricky actually, or well, tricky er rather. Oh, no, it's not, because we don't have to retain the snake. We just have to start the snake fresh. OK, that's easy enough. So what we can do is we can set new level to true, initialize snake. And so what that should do, oh, but we're not deleting our old snake. So actually, there's a bit of a bug here. But we were able to overwrite the uh, the old snake head, though. Okay, yeah. Um, if lives is zero, then game over. Yeah, that's, that's effectively what this logic is doing. So if lives are greater than zero, we're gonna make it. Uh, we're gonna set new level to true so that we we get that pop up again, and then we're gonna initialize our snake again so that it starts at the top left. But we do have to make sure that we don't. Um, uh, if not game over and not, uh, what is it, uh, new level. Because this was overriding the, um, the old, the, basically was uh, writing the snake to the grid. We don't want to write the snake to the grid because we're not erasing it. So we're going to make sure, uh, and we also don't want to go into the stone if we collide with it. We want the, the um, the, uh, we want the, to see the stone and the snake head kind of touch each other so we're aware of just what exactly happened when we lost our life. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. Press space to start. Boom. So once we press space to start again, oh, it's still there. Okay, so it is, it is overriding the, um, the um, what's it called? The da, 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 da. it is overriding the um, the grid at that location. So let's figure out why that is exactly. Why it's not deleting itself. Do a little old-fashioned debugging. Evic says yes. Saw it. Oh, because we're returning here, are we? Oh, wait, no, no. This is only if we. Um, this is only if we actually uh, get to the next level. Oh, because we're not initializing the grid. Wait. Um, snake X and snake Y. New level. Snake clear. Draw a new snake. Yep. That is the logic. Um, in here somewhere during the, uh, well, new level. We don't, we don't want to make a new level necessarily. So the thing is we're keeping the old level so that we can, we can retry it. Um, we're not generating a new one from scratch. We could do that. It would probably be a little bit easier. Um, but I think it feels appropriate to keep the level as it is and then just have the snake, uh, the player uh, using the snake to kind of um, 
just start from the top left again and just do just reenact the new the the existing level. So they feel like they have gone through some sort of discrete uh, progression of levels that exist, rather than just constantly refreshing and making level one be kind of um, ephemeral, I guess. Okay, if uh, ba -ba -ba. okay, it's in our rendering code somewhere. So we are are we are writing to if not game over and not new level. Initialize snake, right, which is what we're doing. There's a subtle, there's a subtle bug in here somewhere. Just have to figure out where it is. So it's this. Um, it's this line of code that actually writes the. Um, oh wait. Uh, it would be the prior value. Oh yes, in that case, it's the prior value, not the um, not the um, blah, 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 what is it? Not the um, first of all. Let's make sure that this is running with uh, multiple segments. So not just the not just the head, but multiple. Okay, so it's the entire snake. Okay, so if we do get a new level, we need to actually clear out all of the snake elements. Um, we need to clear all of the snake elements and then finish the level up. Okay, so what we need to do then is some function called clear snake and then initialize the snake. So currently we have all of our snake elements. They exist in the grid. And then when we collide with something, all of those grid indices, because we're not refreshing the grid, are still going to have snake body, snake head elements still on them. So let's create a new function called clear snake. And uh, for, oh, this is a great, uh, this is a great, um, chance for us to examine how to iterate over a table in Lua. So this is perfect. So for pair, for um, uh, k lm in pairs snake, or rather snake tiles, do um, lm, or rather tile grid lm2 lm1 equal to tile empty. And so what that's going to do, right, assuming the only issue with that is that we are inserting a, uh, a head element into the, um, into the table before we actually clear it. So what we're going to need to do is um, we're going to need to basically uh, we're going to need to basically ignore the first element in the in the in the uh, snake. Right? Let's first let's make sure that theory is correct. So I'm going to run this. If my theory is correct, it'll erase the rock when we when we. Oh, uh, did I call clear snake? I did, right? When writing a function, always make sure you call it as well. Yep. Okay. Perfect. So if I do this, by the way, that's a torturous location for an apple. Okay. Yep. So it got rid of the obstacle. Not what we want, right? Because remember, it pushes ahead onto the snake before it actually does the rendering for it because it wants to check to see if the next element's an apple before it does that, right? So what we can do is clear the snake. There's a couple of ways we could do this. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ignore the first element. So um, if, 
uh, k is equal to uh, k is greater than 1. Because so here's basically iteration in Lua. It, uh, it's similar to iterators in other languages, but basically it takes every key value pair that this function called pairs returns you. So for every k element, so every key value, in this case I'm calling it k and lm, in pairs, every key value pair on the table snake tiles, do, and basically if k is greater than 1, so if it's not the, fir the first element, so anything beyond the head element, um, set lm2 and lm1 in our tile grid index, so the y and the x uh, tile grid at that tile or that snake unit, set that to empty, right? So if I'm correct and I get uh, up size 2 and then collide with this, it got rid of the snake, but it didn't get rid of the obstacle, which is exactly the behavior that we were looking at. And it did decrement lives to 2. So let's try it again. I go here, I'm going to collide with this, boom, and then I have one life left, whoops, game over, oh awesome, and then there's the game over screen, right? I can't hit spacebar, but I can hit enter, uh, and unfortunately we uh, neglected to set our lives to three, so that's a bug as well. But uh, lives are working uh, seemingly correctly, let's go ahead and fix that last issue, let's make sure when we do get a game over, um, after a collision, which is going to be here, game over is true, lives equals three. Let's do that. Oh, actually, no, because uh, if we do that, game over will be set to true, but we'll, when the game over screen pops up, we'll actually see three lives at the top middle, and that's not what we want at all. So uh, I'm going to go to where we have the game over logic, right? And then here I'm going to set to lives equals 3. So where we set the score back to 0, that's where I'm going to set lives equal to 3. And if I run this, Okay, game over, enter, and now we have three lives again. Beautiful. Now, uh, we are missing one detail. Um, clear the snake, uh, start the level again. Yep, exactly. Um, we are missing a, a sound effect that I think would be important, which would be the um, sort of death sound effect. That's, that's, a good, that's a good one, I like that one. We'll use that death.wave. I'm gonna go ahead up into here, set the local death sound equals love dot audio dot new source death dot wave static, and I'm going to go where we have the uh, game over actually registering, which is here. I'm going to set uh, death sound colon play. Um, oh, actually. We probably want, we want, uh, no, 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 this should be, this should be where we just die normally, right? Um, so that, that'll be that. We're going to need, a, we're going to want a separate sound for the, um, we're going to want a separate sound for the game over, right? So let's do that. Let's go over down here. Whoops. Cool. So now we have a now we have a sound effect for when we actually die, which is nice. A little bit of feedback. Um, Bavik says, "Let's not hard code max lives so we can make changes from one place." Yes, that's that is good practice. Yeah, definitely avoid uh, hard coding as much as I've been doing in this uh, in this demo. In future demos, we'll uh, we'll try to adopt a little bit more of a uh, best practices approach um, to programming and like more from an engineering perspective. Um, but in this case, since this is very introductory, we're focusing a little bit more on the syntax and just getting everything up and running. Um, but on Friday, we'll be a little bit more upfront with our engineering, so to speak. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So we have a death sound, which is looking good. Then I want a, uh, I'll lastly want a, um, a game over sound.
That's not bad. It's a little bit weird. I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> Getting creepy. There we go. That's, I think that's more what I'm looking for. All right, game over. Sounds like a classic Atari sound effect, um, but that, that should work. All right, so let's go over here. Got uh, game over dot wave. I'm going to come up to the very top. Yes, exactly the sound a snake would make when it died. Absolutely. Just uh, combustion. Okay. Then back up here. Game over, sound, play. And when we run the game... Okay, cool. Cool. It's good enough, right? It does the job. It does the job. All right. That's pretty much, I think that's pretty much it in terms of, um, in terms of Snake, like a, like a fully playable, fully robust version with like bells and whistles. We have uh, obstacles, we have uh, levels, lives, uh, increasing difficulty, which is important, um, but up to a certain extent. Um, and of course, you know, sound effects, things of that nature. Bobby says, yes, we did it. Yes, we did. Uh, you know, ended last Friday kind of like incomplete, but um, turned it around today. And now we have a very, I would say, very robust um, snake implementation. Definitely feel free. I'm going to, before we, before anything finishes here. I'm going to add everything and commit everything. So we'll just say this is final snake, right? With all the sound effects there, um, all generated sound effects with the non-generated music. Um, but yeah, it came along and we did it together and that was, and that was part of the fun, right? Um, so I think I'll, I'll stick around for a few minutes for questions and stuff. It looks like we finished a little bit early. Um, it's a little bit hard to sort of ballpark when exactly or how long exactly some of these projects will take to finish. Um, Friday's concentration stream will probably be, I'd say it'll probably approach three hours. It may or may not go over the three hour mark. Hard to say. Um, tomorrow we have Kareem Zidane. If any of you are familiar with Kareem from the Facebook group, um, he's one of our full-time staff members from Egypt um, and he uh, is going to be holding a stream tomorrow with me on Git and GitHub. So we'll talk about the basics of Git. If any of you are, are familiar with or unfamiliar with Git and or GitHub, how to use them, um, that's a, uh, it'll be a nice tie-in to a lot of the streams that we have planned for the future, um, mine included. So if you're, you know, if you see what I'm doing with Git and you're a little bit unsure how to do it or how to use your own um, sort of source control, how to use Git and GitHub, how to make it work for you, Cream and I will go over it tomorrow. He'll be leading the way and I'll be sort of playing uh, his assistant and asking questions and sort of pretending like I'm not super familiar with it just to provide kind of a, a different layer to it. Um, as always, if you have any suggestions on, uh, you know, streams that we can host, games you want me to make, topics for other people, in the stream to make, we we do have uh, we are in talks with some other folks potentially about doing a uh, a uh, a web-based assignment. So something in JavaScript, maybe React. Um, we're talking about having possibly a uh, like a machine learning introduction. So maybe something like OpenCV or Scikit-Learn or something like that, using just like a, a Python framework probably for um, uh, for ML or AI, those sorts of things. Um, Bavik says, what time tomorrow? Tomorrow we'll be doing the stream at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so same time as today. And on Friday, the stream is actually going to be at 1 p.m., so a bit earlier in the day, so that folks that are watching from farther out, uh, farther abroad, have a chance to tune in before it's too late. Um, and we may or may not transition to an earlier schedule, 3 p.m. I know um, for folks especially that are, say, in... Um, possibly in India or Bangladesh or other locations far away or having a kind of a tough time keeping up. But 
Um, worst case, all these videos are going to be on our YouTube channel, so you'll be able to see them uh, a little bit later. Um, and folks who don't have the chance to tune in live will be able to at least you know stay up to date. If you haven't um, subscribed to our YouTube channel, do so as well. Um, and if you're here and chatting, you're already uh, following the CS50 TV Twitch.tv channel. But if you haven't followed that and you're watching from YouTube, do go to twitch.tv slash CS50 TV, hit the follow button so that we can chat in real time and uh, you know make some stuff together as a group. Bavik says, I'm from India. Yeah, so I'm sure you'll appreciate the, uh, the schedule being a little bit earlier as well, I imagine. So thanks for tuning in all the way from India, uh, Bavik Knight. All right, like I said, just uh, kind of linger around for some questions. I see there's 15 people in the stream. If you have any questions about game programming or Snake or anything that's coming up or will come up, definitely ask now. Be curious if anybody does. Uh, Bavik says, adios. Adios, Bavik. Good to have you. Thanks so much for coming. I'll see you next time, I'm sure. JP says, I have a question. Shoot, JP. Let's see your question. I missed the intro on the very first stream. How are you affiliated with Harvard, actually? So I'm a full-time technologist here at Harvard, and I spend all my time working with CS50. Um, this year, I also taught uh, an extension school course, uh, GD50, so Harvard's intro to, or CS50's intro to game development. So if you go to cs50.edx.org slash games, you'll see this here, oops, sorry, uh, don't know my location. Oh, pop-ups are terrible on here. Um, CS50's Introduction to Game Development, where we talk about how to make a lot of classic games, like Mario, Zelda, Pokemon, Angry Birds, a lot of classics. Um, and we use Love2D and Lua for the first few lectures as well. So this is on edX, and you have a chance to explore that uh, at your leisure. Mavic Knight, uh, I'll be there to learn Git, GitHub. Awesome. Yeah, join, let all your friends know, let them you know, suggest that they follow us and join the live chat. Happy to increase the, uh, the pool of folks contributing. Um, the more people we have in the stream, the more we can maybe look at doing like live collaborative stuff, which would be interesting. Um, how to show a big apple for a few seconds? Not a question, but a suggestion. Is it possible for you to make a shorter, a bit easier game or video for beginners, Nuwanda? Oh, a technologist. I've never heard of that term before, says JP Guy. Um, Elias, how to show a big apple for a few seconds? Well, uh, to show a big apple, it would be a little bit trickier, but there's a few things you could do in the... Um, so right now, what we're doing is a grid-based approach. So this might be something we could better illustrate if we did a... Um, if we did a, a sprite-based game. Uh, because then you could just scale the sprite, or you could just sort of have a larger sprite file. But we're just drawing rectangles. And everything is aligned on a very discrete grid. If we wanted to make apples that were, let's say, 2 by 2 or 3 by 3, um, 3 by 3 blocks wide, you could, um, where do we have, generate obstacle. So in Generate Obstacle, you could say something like um, if, whoops, if obstacle is equal to, let's say, tile big apple, right? Um, or just in this case, big apple, since it won't be a tile. You could then say, well, I guess it would be tile big apple, right? Because we want to make it maybe worth more. Um, then you would set tile grid at obstacle y, obstacle x to, to um, tile big apple, and then tile grid uh, obstacle y, whoops, not tile grid, obstacle y, obstacle x plus 1 equal to tile big apple, and uh, so on with the y, and then so on with the xy. And that would have the result of populating four of your grid indices with the apple um, tile, 
And then you could just detect an intersection with your snake head in one of those and just trigger it as a um, trigger it as a big apple. And then maybe add three points instead of four points. Um, the only issue then is you have to clear all of the um, all of those four tiles. And so you have to sort of keep track somewhere else of where those four tiles are so that you can delete them from your game scene. Additionally, you have to also check to see whether or not all four of those tiles happen to be empty. Because if you're writing an individual tile, right, it's not a big problem because here we're checking to see if the obstacle y and x are at that one tile empty. You would actually have to do this same thing, but for all four of those empty, or all four of those um, uh, apples, uh, those big apple tiles, rather than just the one. So you would need to, you know, do, um, you would basically choose four uh, random pairs. So one, two, three, four, and then um, do, an, do basically a combo if statement that's basically this times four as well. And it's a little bit trickier also for the random number generator, especially with larger, larger um, concentrations of stones, to be able to find empty blocks of um, empty blocks of tiles, kind of in the way I guess memory fragmentation works, where if you have a pool of memory and you have a bunch of little files or little blocks of code stashed away amongst it, and you're looking for a big continuous uh, chunk of memory. Um, it's a little bit takes a little bit more time to find that chunk if your memory is like super fragmented and all kind of split up all over the place. Um, good question. I don't think we have enough time quite to um, implement it from scratch, but it would be a great exercise if you are uh, potentially looking to um, implement that sort of thing. And maybe in the future, if we have time, we'll come back to it as well. But good question. Um, Possibly make a shorter, bit easier game video for beginners. Again, um, yeah, a games. Let's see. So Pong is the first game that I made. So David kindly added that into the. Um, uh, David kindly added a little uh, an excerpt there. You might like some of the earliest weeks of NXO games and some other games as well. And in that in that chunk of uh, those chunk of videos, we do cover things like Pong, which is a pretty straightforward game. Um, a little bit simpler, so we can maybe explore that on another stream. The memory game is going to be very easy as well on Friday, so maybe join us for that stream. And um, that should give us, I think, a little bit easier of a time at getting into some of these details. This is a bit longer because Snake is a deceptively complex game. Um, we're looking at 321 lines of code at the very end. Um, but memory game is probably going to be maybe half of that. So shouldn't be too shouldn't be too difficult. Also a grid related game too, um, a grid based game rather. Um, yeah, technologists are. It's a very flexible term, JP. Um, uh, it, especially uh, the, the one I guess uh, I'd be char uh, characterized or categorized as is a educational technologist. So he's trying to find and work with tools that um, uh, help us, you know, improve the way we distribute educational material with CS50 um, and just content creators and educators like. Um, all around, I would say. Um, but it, it, it's a very flexible role, for sure. Um, quick question about tomorrow's stream. What software will I be needing? I am from uh, mobile today, formatting PC, and setting up new development stuff. Um, so Bavic, if you just can install Git on your machine, um, if you're on a Mac, it's really easy. You can, um, I think it comes by default. I'm not 100% sure. You might need the Xcode install tools. Um, on either way, you can download it fairly easily. Uh, I think they recommend Homebrew um, for Macs by if. Uh, oh no, they have a Git for Mac on here. So if you go to Git uh, at Lat, it's at latacian.com slash git slash tutorials slash install git. Um, yeah, it says if you installed Xcode or command line tools, Git's already installed. Um, git, there's a Git for Mac installer. There's Git for Windows and um, Linux as well has a uh, um, installer. We'll just look up Ubuntu just to get a sense of what that looks like. Yeah, you would use your package manager. It looks like for Ubuntu, it's apt get install git dash core. So it depends on your operating system. Um, but yeah, install git and then ideally make a GitHub account if you don't have a GitHub account already. So you can do that just by going to, if I were on a brand new 
um, web browser. So github.com, it'll take you right to where you can sign up. Um, heavily recommend getting a GitHub account. Um, Andre, hi Colton, just got here. I have a question that's only tangentially related, so no biggie if you don't answer, but got any hot tips on where to get cool 3D game assets and anything for audio? Um, so there is a few places. So if you're using Unity, which I recommend you probably do if you're getting into 3D, the Unity Asset Store has a ton of free stuff. Um, and that's you'll, you'll see that actually within your Unity editor. Um, I believe it's Window. Um, uh, general asset store is the uh, the menu drop down and then um, there's some other places where you can get 3d models for free if you just type in free 3d models I believe uh, most of the first few resources I believe I've used turbo squid free 3d these are all pretty legit um, it's a little bit trickier importing certain file formats than other ones but I would just fish around and kind of get a sense um, Turbo Squid, I think, is good, and Free 3D. Those are the two that I think I have actually messed with. Um, but again, if you're using Unity, Asset Store is great. A lot of great free ones. Um, and the Standard Assets Pack has a lot of really cool stuff. And the uh, there's a lot of good paid stuff, too. If you end up going down the Unity dev route and you want to actually pay for your resources, or you don't mind paying for your resources, definitely worth spending a little bit of money. Um, Metal Eagle, I have a question. Is Lua a good programming language to create games, or is it just limited to just the simple 2D games? What is Lua actually better at compared to the other programming languages? So Lua is used very often, very frequently throughout the games industry, not only just for 2D stuff, but for 3D stuff. Um, a ton of engines use Lua commercially. Um, uh, just recently I saw a game, Don't Starve, was being modded, which is a 2D game, but it was being modded in Lua. World of, War, World of, uh, World of Warcraft uh, was modded traditionally in Lua. I'm not sure if they still mod in Lua, but I think they might. Um, a ton of game engines, 3D and 2D, use Lua. The two primary game engines now, Unity and Unreal, don't use Lua, but you can get Lua embedded into your Unity projects with a special um, DLL. So it's totally usable in there. And uh, Lua is absolutely perfect for 2D game development um, using Lua, uh, using Love 2D and using some other frameworks that uh, utilize it. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's a totally great language. One of the fastest scripting languages too, using what's called Lua JIT, which is the just-in-time um, compiler. And I believe Love ships with this by default. So you get really fast, dynamic recompilation of your um, uh, of your Lua code, and it's just very, it's very fast c compared to other scripting languages. Good question. Um, it has some weird syntactical oddities that are, you know, um, specific to Lua itself, but it's very easy to get over that. And the, the syntax at large is um, actually quite nice and pleasant to work in. And the Love 2D API especially is very, um, very robust and um, uh, just pleasant to work with. Um, appreciate the response. Yeah, no problem, everybody. I'm on Windows 10, have GitHub Friday, CS50. Cool, we'll get it installed. Um, so Bavik on, uh, have GitHub from CS50. Oh, from CS50. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah tomorrow, tomorrow, to be clear, is the stream with GitHub at 3 p.m. with Kareem and I. And then um, on Friday is uh, will be another stream by myself where we code a brand new game, um, Concentration, the uh, memory card game. So yes, uh, Metal Eagle, I did not know that. Thanks, CS50 TV. No problem. No problem at all. All right, uh, I'll stick around for just a couple more questions. We're at 5.55. We have another five minutes before we adjourn. Um, if anybody wants to talk about anything or has any questions. Um, but other than that, we're getting close to the wrapping up point. Have a good day, everyone. Pleased to be here. See you tomorrow, says Bavik. Thanks, Bavik, for coming in. Have a good day to you as well. I'll see you tomorrow. Bella Curious says, that was fun. Thank you for this amazing stream. Thanks, Bella, for coming in. Appreciate it. Um, come join us tomorrow. Come join us Friday. Make some more games and do some more cool stuff. <laughs> Thanks, JP.
I have heard that game programming jobs have long hours and very little pay. It may depend on the area, but what do you know about it? Um, I've heard mixed things as well. So it depends on what studio you work for. If you work for a AAA studio, chances are you will be working long hours. You're probably working 60 hours, especially towards the end of a game's product or development life cycle. It's not uncommon, based on what I've read, for most studios to approach for their core engineering staff somewhere around 60 hours uh, for work weeks. Um, Rumors are going around about Red Dead uh, Redemption 2 having 100-hour um, work weeks, but the creators of that have come out and said that it was just the writers who initially had that and that the engineering team um, were not expected to work 100-hour work weeks. Um, but if you're an indie developer or you're working for a company that maybe does other types of games, like less, um, not AAA games, maybe like a mobile development company, um, you'll, you can expect to see something more along the lines of 40 to 50 hours. Um, if you're an indie developer, you might still end up spending more than 40, 50, 60 hours finishing your game, especially as you approach the end of the development life cycle if you have a hard set deadline, just because games are notorious for taking a long time and having a lot of hard to track down bugs that manifest themselves at unfortunate times. Um, I mean, just as you saw, making Snake wasn't a terribly easy thing to do, and we saw a lot of weird bugs that we didn't anticipate. Um, and I mean, this was, like I said, my first time also implementing Snake from scratch, but we hopefully got a chance to see just how um, true this is with even the most simple of game development. Um, you know, extrapolate this out to something massive like modern AAA titles, and uh, yeah, it gets, it gets out of hand very quickly. Especially if you're not programming in something as easy to rapidly develop in as, uh, as Lua. If you're maybe working with a, a C++ code base and you're doing engine development and, not, um, and you're having to recompile everything every time you make any adjustments. It gets, it gets tricky. Um, thank you and good night because it's tw uh, 11 o'clock in Morocco. Thanks, Elias. Like I said, we'll try and get uh, our streams set up maybe a little bit earlier. Fridays will be at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so it'll be two hours earlier. So you'll hopefully be ending a little bit, a little bit sooner. Yes, programming games myself, I see bugs that are very hard to correct. Yeah, and you'll get better at it, um, and you'll also be able to anticipate things a little bit better, but it, it can be tricky for sure. Um, but I love games, and I think they're a lot of fun, so I don't know. Greetings from Serbia. Which book would you recommend for C learning? Thanks. Um, says Neo... Uh, <laughs> Oh man, this is gonna be a hard one to pronounce. Neo Crescesine. I don't know. I I'm sorry. I'm having a really hard time pronouncing that one. Neo Crescesine. Crescesine. Um, books for learning C. So I, the very first book that I ever learned C on was. Um, let's see if my Amazon. This is not okay. I'm not signed in. So C programming. Um, I heard this book is good, the Programming in C book. I haven't actually read it. Uh, everybody talks about the C programming language. This is by Brian Kernigan and Dennis Ritchie, who are the creators of C and Unix. Um, so I would probably recommend that. David's got some links in, uh, in the chat there. CS50 has an official C um, programming list. So definitely pop into that and see what's up. Um, oh, this is a new book. I haven't seen this one before. 21st Century C. That might be worth looking at. I'll have to maybe check that one out. Um, C in a nutshell. There's a ton of books. Honestly, the, uh, any of these books will probably work. C Primer Plus is good. I've read through parts of that one. Read through several books. Watch videos. Watch tutorials. There's a lot of resources now. Book learning isn't strictly necessary for all of your learning. Um, I honestly, the first book that I ever learned, and I'm not too ashamed to admit it, was actually uh, C for Dummies. This was the first book. Is it even on here? Yeah, C for Dummies. This was the first book um, that I ever used to learn um, programming formally. I guess you could say formally, um, whereas not in the uh, not in the context of like game programming, I guess, or like a book that was teaching scripting, but actual programming. This was the first book that I learned, and it's pretty good. I remember it, I actually uh, enjoyed it. It's got good reviews. C plus plus for Dummies as well. I looked at that one, um, but yeah. Whatever book works for you. Honestly, different people are going to get different things out of different books. So different resources work for different people. And YouTube is rife with tutorials, and even CS50 itself is a good resource for learning C. So there's a, there's a ton. Um, uh, Andre, uh, is, uh, I'm not sure what language that is. Is that Czech? 
Head first C, Kochan. Thank you for hanging out with us in the chat, Professor Malin. Says JP. Nick and Aang, do not look back, son. I do have to head out, but see you next time. Thanks, David, for coming into the chat. Everybody, say bid farewell to David. Give him, uh, give him some more uh, Twitch, Twitch emotes. Give him some, give him some kappas. I love the kappa is my favorite, so I'm good for kappa every time, 24/7. There we go. JP is always happy to oblige with the Kappas. Nuwanda as well. All right, uh, with that, it's uh, 6.02. So um, we're going to call it here. This is the end of our stream. Uh, Andre's got the meat boy emoji. There we go. That's a good one. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for coming out for the conclusion to Snake. Um, we've come a long way from the beginning of the day where we had an Etch-A-Sketch and the end of the day where we have a pretty much full polished game. Um, tomorrow again, Kareem Zidane and I, Git and GitHub, and on Friday, Concentration. So uh, this is CS50 on Twitch. My name is Colton Ogden. It was a pleasure. I will see all of you later. Thanks so much again.